somewhere, but I'm going to hit recording here locally so that I make sure I get a copy of this. Um, so what did we want to talk about? I'm going to fill out the agenda here. Let me rearrange and try not to spill. That would be a horrible way to start a stream by spilling stuff. All right. So I noticed during my uh, build presentation that I kept going to, I kept going to type and I kept talking like this and it was horrible. Somebody should have stopped me. All right, so uh, I want to recap, whoops, recap, announcements. Um, it's the Norton Now Recap. Ooh, I have a theme song. I have a jingle, y'all. <laughs> jingle. I love it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to take you with me everywhere. You know what? We've been doing so many streams together, Shane, that either you're really getting uh, used to me and we're just being silly now, or you're really just sick of me and you're like, ah, this guy. Either way, or uh, both. It, it could be both. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably getting used to it, and then just the the getting over the nerves a bit more. Nerves, yeah. Now you've been yeah. doing some the, amazing streams. Uh, we should probably mention that you've been doing streams like every Friday, right? Yeah, usually every Friday around about two hours earlier than now, but like one thirty Pacific time. Just focused on, um, yeah, just focused on pushing Shell along and then just there for any questions people have about literally anything. So, um, yeah, it's just on the Xamarin Forms team Twitch channel. Yep, which is, I yeah. will type it here. It's it's the uh, well, Twitch TV. Hello, Twitch TV slash, is it Xamarin Forms team? Yeah. Yeah. So you can find Shane there Fridays. Um, his... Uh, Twitter handle is below his face. All right. So we talked about doing app bar demos, tab bar demos. Um, and if, if anybody has questions while we're kicking, you know, through, we got three hours. <laughs> so tee those questions up and we'll try to uh, to get to them as we go here. And we are going to be do some live coding. So um, bear with me while I, uh, I get us rolling here. This also lets people kind of filter in and and whatnots. Um, okay, app bar, tap bar, tab bar, uh, service locator and shell. Ooh, that sounds like fun. I'm, I'm excited about that. That's a Maui, .NET Maui kind of a thing. Um, and then we've also got a shell spec, like a shell v2 spec, which I'll cover here in just a second. Just, you know, I'll touch on it. Um, and then we've also got fast renders, or is it fast renders or we, slim renders is what you mean, I think. Yeah. We can take a look at that. Cool. Did I miss anything in, in this agenda? This look good? Any, anybody in the in the Twitch channel uh, that wants to throw a comment in here and say, hey, we want you to talk about something? Yeah, that's where I planned it. The left channel only <laughs> is pretty terrible. It's messing with people. Let me see. Is that something I can fix? This is what I get for switching up. I'm here for y'all. What is the uh, dun, 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 dun. my mic active? If I choose mono, does that change anything? Did that? It looks like I'm I'm hitting both now. Looks like I'm hitting two bars left and right. Paths and gradients. Yeah, yes. we might talk about Yay. that. Woo um, the XAML flavor for Maui. This is a this is an evolution of Xamarin Forms. So uh, everything you see in Xamarin Forms uh, XAML implementation will be coming forward. Now, typically, when uh, you know when people ask about XAML, there's it's a, it's a multi layered thing, right? There's the syntax of XAML related features like Visual State Manager, data binding, styling, and things like that. And then there's the names of the controls and the properties of the controls, which are really two completely separate things. But it's because, of course, with Xamarin Forms, you can build out a whole app uh, in C Sharp. You can build it in F Sharp. Um, and uh, similarly in .NET MAUI, you know, we have demoed the model view update style with a fluent UI syntax. Uh, in Xamarin Forms today, we have the C Sharp for markup syntax that is an experimental feature. You can take advantage of those markup extensions or... I guess they're they're more like method extensions, aren't they, Shane? Is that the appropriate way to say that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Promote. They're just normal like class extensions. Yeah. 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 But they're but they're yeah. super super useful. So, you know, it's it's a it's a multi layered thing. Um, 
to, to those who have been doing Xamarin and Xamarin Forms from day one, XAML has, uh, and that's their XAML experience. It's a, it's a different topic, really it is. Even conceptually, when I speak with people, and I, I have spoken to a lot of people about the topic, um, it, it, uh, it's, it's thought of and used very differently than uh, if you come from a Windows developer background where you've been using XAML or a Silverlight background for that matter. So um, happy to talk more about that, but um, that's not a, not a huge part of what we're going to be talking about today. Animation support, yeah, I mean, certainly the animation you have today. However, we do have some pretty interesting things that we've been experimenting with in terms of animation. Um, so we may be able to bring that forward into .NET MAUI. We'll see. Um, yeah, there's we, some stuff with the tab view that Javier hooked together um, that we'll see if we can get a time to play with. So he hooked in some stuff in there where he's basically just using forms animations to animate between the views. Um, so yeah, if we get to that, we can kind of maybe try to create our own animations yeah. there. Yeah, and then keep a look on Javier's channel. I know he's doing a stream tomorrow, uh, I think just to his own channel, which is going to be really heavy look at tab view animations and things like that. So. Yeah, if somebody could throw that uh, into the channel, one of the moderators. Yeah. We've got a couple moderators. Pierce, I believe, is here. Um, Alex Blount. Sweeky is going to join us at some point. Uh, not everybody could be here for the full three hours, uh, but um, definitely some team members, some of the engineering team as well as the program management team is, is around, hanging about. So um, I, I appreciate your help answering questions in the chat. Let me... Um, let me uh, just go quickly over some of the announcements. This is this is from my presentation. I'm not gonna <laughs> reproduce my presentation. Nobody needs to see me fumbling around again with dad jokes. Um, but I will quickly pop through a few things. Boop, boop, boop. So uh, definitely wanted to highlight what's new in Xamarin Forms 4. These are things that you can be using today. Um, and it's important as we look at the next 18 months in this road to uh, November 2021.NET 6.NET MAUI um, that we continue to have, uh, you know, deliver value in the Xamarin Forms releases because we will continue shipping every six weeks. Um, that's not going to change. But, um, you know, it's a balance and the balance will start to kind of cross over as we approach, uh, you know, next summer and things will ramp up. I think everybody can imagine how this is going to go. Um, but in Xamarin Forms 4, what was really cool is, is as I was looking at what has happened over the course of the 4. Dot series, um, it really was apparent that I didn't need to go create my own samples. I, you know, back back in previous versions, I really had to spend some time saying, okay, man, I really need to make something good looking because some of our some of the samples that I had were just not there. Um, and now looking at the community, and Javier maintains this website that you see on here, the AKA MS will get you to his GitHub. He has been adding five to seven, he says, good looking UI samples like every week. And that's just amazing. So uh, I figured why not just highlight what the community has been doing. So some examples, this is collection view. Oh, I should probably try to hide that header real quick. Can I do this? Can I do this? Do I know how? Look at that. I do know how. Um, so collection view, powerful uh, replacement potentially, but um, for list view. Uh, does a lot of what list view does we're still working on feature parity um, but it's you know super useful now today especially if you're doing grid layouts and things like that so really great example here you can see the github um, and i need to get my taskbar out of the way now uh, you can see the github down there from damien shell which we'll be talking a bit about today um, the ability to have top tabs bottom tabs fly out menu um, uri based routing and things like that um, so we'll talk about what we've been hearing from you, what we've been learning, and how we're going to take that to the next phase. Visual, the ability to uh, theme, essentially, all this, the controls in your app with a single package uh, just by using that visual moniker uh, at any level in your app, from the control level all the way up to the app level, and have it um, cascade throughout. So this began with the material renderers. It's an API that we could continue using for other things. We've explored using, uh, using this to implement the Fluent UI, although uh, as we've been talking about that, and this isn't something we'll go into today, but uh, it seems to make sense. I, I did a, a quick prototype of this. It seems to make sense to take the Fluent UI design standard and implement it 
with styles and Xamarin forms. Um, and in a couple of cases, some, com some composite controls, but for the most part, we should be able to style apps to look this way. And really that's a, that's a testament to how far we've come in Xamarin forms in terms of API, uh, filling gaps, solving paper cuts and things like that. There's still work to do for sure. Um, we've got a list of things, but um, I think that this this has value even beyond the Fluent UI to uh, your own designs, uh, your own design guides, uh, your own app needs. If we can do this with, with the Fluent UI, then you ought to be able to do it with anything that you're being given easily, right? And that's that's the key is do it easily. Uh, you can always go to the uh, platform level, of course, and, and get to the fine grain control, but we want to make you productive. Um, Carousel view, based on the same ancestor as collection view, very cool stuff. And then swipe view. Um, I see that we've uh, done quite a few bug fixes in this. It's a preview feature, um, but we are aiming uh, over the course of the next four dot series um, as we approach Xamarin Forms 5 to get as many of these to, to stable as uh, are being used and useful. Um, some things may stay behind an experimental flag during the transition to uh, .NET MAUI, but we'll see. Um, it's really being driven by your feedback and, and what's most useful to you. Um, wish we could do absolutely everything, but that's not necessarily the case. Uh, expander view, really cool contribution um, from Andre Misjukovic. Uh, he's got quite a few cool controls out there. More of those controls are coming. And then C Sharp UI. Uh, yeah. David, I don't know if you want to move our, our videos over just a little less. Is that driving people so nuts? People, uh, Pierce had mentioned something just so they can see the app. <laughs> Let me see. I probably just need to hide us. If that's bit. if that's easy, my camera, this one, guest camera, this one. Just uh, so they, they problem, can see all the beauty. Problem is, is when I remove you, nobody can hear you. So I could just. Boop, boop, boop. I just want to lose you. That's the thing. I just hide you down there. Just reach your hand up into the upper right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there is some. There is definitely some beauty here. I'll even go back, and you can kind of see some of these things. Well, and then the C sharp UI, um, a wonderful contribution contribution from Vincent. This is behind an experimental flag. We will have some work to do, uh, especially if you saw the uh, MVU demo that uh, uses a fluent like syntax as well. We'll need to kind of look at both of these and say what is the right way forward so that we have a consistent fluent syntax and fluent API for creating UI. So, um, but it's useful as it stands today. We value it, you value it, so it's in the product. And then there's plugins. These are some third-party plugins. I don't mean to blow through these, but I guess we do have three hours, whatever. Um, <laughs> Some really great plugins from the community that are we know are being used to great effect by many of you, um, and these are definitely ones that you ought to know about. I, uh, I in particular, am super fond whoops, of the uh, shared transitions one. I think that's just so cool. <laughs> Is that a Lammy? Lammy P. Yep. Man? That's awesome. Got it for my birthday. Um, <laughs> different, you know, Neo... Uh, was it neoskeuomorphism? Neoskeuomorphism. Um, Pancake view, of course, super popular. One of the best icons out there. Uh, and then Sharp NATO, which has been a, a good inspiration for us in terms of uh, cool tabs uh, that you can use cross-platform. And we're going to show you a little bit of that today. Uh, yep, we did the dual screen stuff. Very cool dual screen stuff. If you haven't seen that, if you haven't played with it, definitely check it out. I know Craig Dunn, who uh, used to be with our team with documentation and was with Xamarin for years and years and years, is now on the Surface Duo team. And uh, I believe he had a session at Build and did a really cool um, dual screen app with Xamarin. So I look forward to seeing that as well. I'm not going to do a demo. We'll recap. There's a lot of things that happened this year. Um, and we have been shipping a lot of features, no doubt about it. So I think that uh, one of the key focuses for us as we make this transition into .NET MAUI is that we will be slowing down the feature work. We'll be working on the underlying uh, infrastructure. We'll talk about the renderer work today as well. Um, but that also means that uh, we're not going to be adding as many of these features ourselves. Certainly, if you're doing pull requests and contributing, um, we, will, we will work to get those into the product. There will be a conversation as to do they go in Xamarin Forms or can they go in .NET MAUI. Um, and we'll, we'll work through that. Um, that's a conversation we want to have with you and we'll figure that out. So 
here's what's coming in Xamarin Forms 5. These are things that we've been hearing from you for quite a while and very excited to, to do some work on. Um, in shell, how do I do login view? How do I do forgot password? How do I do a onboarding, uh, sequence? Um, things like that. How do I, uh, create routes and route to things that are not part of my tab bar flyout menu, etc.? How can I hide flyout menu items? How can I hide tab bar menu items? How can I disable tab bar menu items? These kinds of things. Um, how can I style them effectively? How can I position them in different locations in my view? All really good uh, feedback, and so that's guiding some of the new stuff that we're going to show you today. Uh, linear gradient brush, we have a pull request for this. It's coming to you perhaps in 4.7. This is what I was talking to Samantha about uh, last week, is I updated our roadmap. So if you want to go look at the Xamarin Forms repository roadmap, uh, you'll get some of that uh, information. Shapes and paths, um, I don't think that we're going to be showing any of this today. We're going to focus more on the things that we uh, put on the, on the agenda at the beginning. But very cool stuff here. This is all native graphics stuff. Um, so it's the primitives that you would need to be able to create a screen like you see over here uh, with that chat bubble, the circle with the dot, the dashed lines, etc. So we are going to talk about this, the tab view. Um, and actually this is uh, part, this design right here is from the sequence of designs that we're going to look at building. So excited about that. I'll probably need to uh, pull that design up in Figma so that we can work with it. Uh, app bar, having a fully cross-platform app bar that you can control every single pixel of that puppy and uh, make it consistent across platforms. Very cool stuff. Um, that's the schedule for releases. Xamarin Forms will continue 5.0, 5.01, 5.02, or maybe 5.1, 5.2. We'll figure out what's going to be in those releases at that time. But really, from the 5.0 uh, point on, we're going to be starting to transition more and more of the work to .NET MAUI and doing priority bug fixes and stability fixes and performance stuff. Okay, so I think that's pretty much what I wanted to show in terms of slides. I think, yes. Uh, we do talk a bit about Maui. Does, do y'all want me to recap the Maui announcements? I guess we could, we could do that. I probably should do that. Um, so what is .NET Maui? So let me run that. So if you're not familiar, um, so later this year, November, we are going to be shipping .NET 5. Um, this is a unification of many pieces of .NET. Um, it simplifies the story, and it creates the, uh, the foundation for the single SDK, one base class library, unified tool chain. Uh, you get cross-platform native UI, cross-platform web UI, and so from five to six, we're gonna be realizing this and unifying more and more closely. Um, whereas Xamarin and the Mono uh, runtime and framework were kind of a separate bit, now they're all merged in. Uh, you're going to be seeing the same thing happening across all of, why does my doc keep coming up? Sorry. Um, you're gonna see that across everything that we've been working on. Oh, I love my bot on the, uh, on the surfboard, I think this is this is the way to go. Um, so .NET Maui is desktop and mobile, cross-platform, native UI. It's a single project, single code base, deploying to multiple devices, mobile and desktop, evolution of Xamarin Forms. And it will preview later this year. Um, and so we'll start shipping on the previews that we get for .NET 6 and making those available to you. Um, there will be a transition. We will be providing guides. We'll be working through what that transition for existing projects looks like. But primarily, especially in the first phases, we're, we're recommending, and I think it's reasonable that you uh, use new uh, projects and kind of explore and, and check things out. We've got some really great GitHub issues already. Lots of activity on GitHub for what you would like to see, How you know questions about how will this look, how will that look. I actually have an FAQ up. Um, as a matter of fact, why don't I just go ahead and pull that up right now because I think that would be useful. Um, so in the wiki, there's an FAQ. Um, and this will answer probably most of your questions. Um, so definitely check that out. Dear Doc, go away. That thing just will not disappear forever. Um, should you be upgrading? Uh, why is this even happening to me? <laughs> what is MBU? <laughs> what have you done? 
Um, you know, we're obviously very excited about it. Uh, this is building on six years of Xamarin Forms. By the time that this transition happens, Xamarin Forms will be seven, seven and a half years old. Um, that's, you know, while uh, certainly there's there are things that we would love to improve, we're going to be doing a lot of those improvements for .NET MAUI. It's an opportunity for us to, to really stage the whole platform for a very long and illustrious future. So we're setting the stage for future modern development experiences like you saw in the keynote um, and other things. As a matter of fact, let's see here. So I will uh, also go back to the main uh, part of the readme here real quick to highlight for you. I've got kind of a grid. Oh, and look how look how much stuff is in this repository. It's kind of intimidating, Shane. It's, it's kind of freaking me out. <laughs> Yeah, bring, we'll get it filtered down now. as the. Uh, oh, I'm bringing you back, man. I'm bringing you back. Yeah, I'm bringing back. you back too. It's important. Pure weens back. <laughs> oh, is he uh -oh. back? <laughs> Pardon the dogs. Amazon's here. Dogs are freaking out. All right, but you're on top of me, Shane. Stop it. Yeah. There we go. Um, so uh, there is a lot of stuff here. Uh, we aren't going to talk about this until later, but I think it's pretty cool. When I go look at the, uh, this is the Slim Renderers branch, right, Shane? No, it's yes. not. Is it? I thought it was yeah. much smaller than this. Oh, um, no, I pull? mean, this is this is sort of like a first. All I really okay. did was add the Maui core that we've That's been right. working on there to it. Okay, okay. Yeah, it, right didn't, it didn't, yeah, it didn't pull everything out. Uh, uh, yeah. So what yeah. I was trying, what I was trying to get excited about and get you excited about is how we're going to grossly, <laughs> grossly simplify. That's probably the horrible way to say it. That's not going to be the headline of a blog post. .NET grossly simplifies. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's the structure of the project is going to change. Uh, we're really going to simplify it. Uh, I think contributors will feel much more welcome and be able to find their way around. Um, but in the meantime. I wanted to oops, go to the readme here. All right, so down here I've kind of got a Xamarin Forms versus .NET MAUI, kind of what is the comparison? How does this look as we make this transition? Um, what's going to be available to you? And now you are in the way, so I will just do this because this is going to be easier. So well, now I just need to do this. I know how to use computers. It's fine. Everything's fine. <laughs> I have screen inception going on. Um, so yeah, um, you know, what, what are we lighting up? Uh, single project. It's not a requirement, but it's really going to vastly simplify. Yay. Um, your starting point, you can absolutely still do multiple projects. The existing project structures will be supported. Um, we're not doing away with that. This is, this is a kind of a helpful onboarding as well as a nice productivity boost that we think uh, is going to be a huge win. Multi-targeting, we're going to be taking advantage of that, both in the source and in this, uh, in projects in general. Multi-window for desktop support, it's important. We kind of have a hacked together multi-window. Um, maybe hacked is, is a not nice way of saying it, um, but it's there. We do have customers that use multi-window, both for Mac OS and for Windows, but um, we need to productize it. We, you know, it was kind of a one-off, right? Um, so we need to do that. .NET 6, uh, the project system is a big deal. SDK style is coming. Um, and then, of course, what is the uh, what are the IDE supported VS and VS for Mac? Absolutely. And then we're looking to light up VS Code. Um, we, we know that there is an opportunity here. It, it aligns with the other .NET workloads and what you're doing that. If I survive this night, you'll be fine. <laughs> it's all fine. Why don't we use our own streaming platform? We do use Mixer. We stream our uh, we stream our standups to Mixer. Um, yeah, and a lot of stuff goes to Mixer. Yep, but uh, we also want to be where developers are and where the audience is. And there's a, a very large, vibrant audience here on Twitch and on YouTube. So it's all about that as well. Um, okay, so enough of that. Uh, before I turn it over to Shane, let me do one more thing because I saw that this was open and I saw it was still running. This is, oh, close that. This is uh, from my demo. 
um, where I have uh, system.maui, and I have the model view update with my linear gradient and everything. And now you are in my way, Shane, but I will go ahead and just move <laughs> this over a little bit. And everybody can see I can increment some things. Isn't that super jazzy cool? And then I'll make this a bit smaller. I can do this. Um, and then I can go in here and I can kind of revert back to what I said before. I will code lines. Let's see if this is going to update. Yep, it's updating. So this has been debugging for, for days, weeks, might maybe a week. <laughs> Seriously, I have not stopped this thing since I recorded my presentation for build. Um, and it's still working. So uh, some of the cool things that you can kind of see in here, um, if I go down here like to this button, I can start building this thing out. Um, and you know I can do the whole rounded border. I could do just a background color. Let's do a color dot. Ooh, now I'm going to mess up my design and do something horrendous. You know, I can do stuff like that. Um, I can give it a give it a height. Whoops, not frame dot height. Frame height uh, eighty eight. So and this um, is the MVU stuff here. This is the MVU fluent syntax, right? Okay. So this is this is the kind of based on our learnings from the Comet experiment from James Clancy. Um, and he showed off some of this as well. And he probably does a whole lot better job than I did. He did a Twitch stream yesterday. Uh, that video is available on YouTube for sure. It may be available, I guess, wherever the Microsoft developer stuff is being put. Um, so you can totally check that out. Uh, a little margin action on there. We can um, do uh, do the whole rounded border to match. Let's just match this thing up here so that it looks looks consistent ish. And then, uh, do I need a text color or color? Text color or color? Just color. Oh, that's horrible. Oh, it hurts so bad. It hurts so bad. Pick a new color. Pick a new color. Purple. See, there's a question about multi-screen devices. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't think there's anything too special about that scenario with Maui. It's um, as far as like how to work with the Surface Duo. I mean, I think a lot of that'll just be how you want it to work. Um, so, like right now, a lot of the Surface Duo and things is usually it's all single window based, but it's like a split. But the content is split. It's not a lot of times. It's not actually two separate windows for the same application. So like on a desktop, it'll just sort of lay out. Um, you know, the main thing that happens with the dual screen is that it it, it modifies the layout so that the center gets uh, so that contents get split up, uh, on each side of the of the center band. So if you're on a desktop, it's basically just, you know, spread out. Um, so like that's how a two pane view works. The two pane view will have a side by side perspective if you're on a desktop where it's wide enough. Um, so I don't know, hopefully that answers your question, Nexus. Good, good, good. What happens when I do padding before setting a frame? So you're referring to the order in which things are set. Does it work like Swift UI? Is that kind of what you're getting at, I imagine, Edgar? Um, so this definitely learns a lot of things from Swift UI, and that is something that we would like to learn from you. What behavior makes the most sense? Does the order in which these things are applied, or is it the aggregate of them once they're combined? What make what takes priority? Because it does matter, definitely does, especially when it comes to doing different effects, um, clippings, shadows, things like that. That makes sense to you, Shane? Yeah. yeah, same with button. If you want to enable them, <laughs> order matters. <laughs> and there are, you know, there are. Um, Order matters in XAML, um, and in some cases you kind of kind of forget about it until you're doing some binding thing, um, and you're like, oh, why why am I not getting my what is it a binding parameter being passed or something like that? And it's because the order in which you have de declared them, that's just the nature of how it works. So, yeah. All right, looking at the chat, seeing what's going on. Shane, are you ready to start showing some stuff? Yeah, we can switch to that portion. All right. I'm 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 looking at the uh, chat. I also need to take a take a drink. I got water and I got water. 
That's what I got tonight. I saw that uh, Dan made a beer comment up there. No beer for me until this is all done and gone. Okay, keep keep the focus. All right, I'm going to flip over to your desktop. Did we? Oh, you know what? We didn't even test your resolution, but look at it. Perfect. Looks all right. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> Locks right in there. It's perfect. Um, so what I may end up doing while you're kind of talking through some things uh, is work on hiding some of the overlays or repositioning a few things to maximize the pleasure for our guests. All right. Yeah, it sounds good. So let's see. I guess on the agenda, did we want to start with, I guess Slim Renders would probably be a better place to start with since okay. this this aspect is going to be the larger demo. Well, I feel like um, you're breaking a contract that we made here when I set the agenda. I feel like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I didn't remember the order. You're good. You're good. Go ahead. All right. I mean, I just made things up as I went let's along. So. All right. I haven't. I haven't ran these in forever, so let's see, let's see if I remember how it works myself. Um, all right, let's. I guess starting from a place of context, let me bring up. Um, let me bring up. Let me bring up the the slim renders um, issue here that Stefan created. Um, all right, so we have this back in our Maui repo. I think so. I thought we did. Where is it? It's on page two. There we go. All right, slim render architecture. So we can kind of talk. We can we can sort of talk about what the intent of uh, the intent of this of this architecture here is. So the idea with this, uh, there was some chat we had on uh, the ticket as well. Um, but the idea here is to sort of invert the dependency and also make renders more uh, consistent and easier to kind of hook into. So I know anybody who's sort of delved deeply into the forms renderer stuff, uh, it's sort of a wild west out there. Like, is there an override? Is there not an override? What does what? Uh, there's not really sort of like a consistent structure uh, but there's a lot of stuff that we want to do to sort of prop that up to make it a lot a lot easier uh, and then also make it more adoptable by other things um, so that it's 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 kind of stands on its own. So as you can kind of see here from this this uh, picture that Sam put together, the current way that forms is put together <clears throat> is that you have like a forms button. And then forms button inherits from like a bindable object. So it's sort of your classical Windows uh, UWP structure. And then the renderers uh, depend on the forms button. And then the renderers uh, have a deep knowledge of how bindable object works. It's all based on like uh, IMPC, uh, notify property changed and things like that, uh, which for example, uh, MVU doesn't use property change at all. So, um, you know, that's not useful to the renderer. So the idea here with the new renderer architecture one is to sort of invert that dependency. So what that becomes then is that all the renderers are now based on interfaces. So you basically have a core representation that is an interface to uh, an interface of what a button could be. Uh, and then anybody could sort of define that button at that point. So forms could define the button or uh, MVU could define a button. Anything could say, hey, this is what, I, for my UI framework, this is what I'm defining the button to be. And then the renderers themselves are now just coded against the button, against the I button. So it's, so now instead of, um, so now instead of like forms core, now instead of the renderer having forms core, forms core has a reference to the renderers if that makes sense. So then inside, and you'll see some of this in the code, but now, so in the code, what will happen is that the uh, the renderer basically has a reference um, to just propagate its changes down to the renderer uh, so that, you know, anybody anybody can really now propagate those changes down to the renderers. So that's so, sort of the, one of the... Oh. Yeah, so so why is this cool? Like, if you're, you're, you're sitting at a conference and somebody's like, okay, that... That all sounds great and fine, but why do I care? What's the value to me? Yeah, 
Okay, so this enables uh, this enables more. Um, it, it creates sort of a loose coupling uh, between the UI implementation and the native implementation. So this now just provides you with a set of renderers that work against pure interfaces. So you could now just take literally any UI paradigm and and express what how you want to express it. Uh, you know, you could do it through have like a blazer button or an MBU button or anything like that. And then the then it can then propagate itself down to the renderers. So mm -hmm. it really kind of sets it up. So um, you know, whatever sort of UI paradigm comes down the road. So I mean you could even someone could even write like a Swift UI UI layer that works against our renderers, you yeah. know. Well you said you said sort the B once... word. You said the B word. So that obviously perks everybody's ears up. Blazer. If everybody doesn't oh, know okay. what the B I, word is, it's Blazer. I was like, I didn't say boat. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was great. Oh, so, uh, yeah. So what we kind of learned, I guess, and, and where so this comes from. that was all right from, that I said, Blazer? You, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I, I, I can never remember what we were saying. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I was like kind of playing in my head. I think I can say it. I'm just going to go for it. <laughs> <laughs> just do it. Just say the B word. So, so I think that the value then, uh, as I think about that scenario, right, because we are doing the, the uh, mobile Blazer bindings, experiment um, and and saying, okay, how might this look? How might this work? Is this something that anybody even wants? Um, it's certainly something that Alon wants. Um, and that's kind of, you know, his gist of why he started do doing this and, and pitched it. But um, in so learning from that, as well as James Clancy, who was in the chat, um, when he was working on Comet and looking at, okay, well, what can you do with forms? I remember there being a lot of gymnastics that they would have to do to make the Xamarin Forms controls, which are, you know, there's a lot. Um, and and it's, it's a great library that is implemented. And again, six plus years old now, or six years old. And so, you know, there's a lot of history and value there that these other uh, coding styles, frameworks would like to take advantage of. But we learned there's some gymnastics and it wouldn't it be great if Blazor and Comet or that style, an MBU style, that way of expressing your app was in control as opposed to the other way around and having to bow to what Xamarin Forms was doing. Now, it seems to me that there's some other benefits as well in, in doing this. Um, as Sweeky points out here, and I know that she has, so Sweeky Swack Attack uh, works on our mobile customer advisory team. And uh, so with customers doing some really cool high profile stuff. So be very nice to her. She's, she's the friend you want, the little sister you never knew you needed. Um, <laughs> actually, Sweeky, look what shirt I'm wearing. Uh... Oh, uh Audio just switched to like you're in a can. I uh, did we lose sound? They're saying we lost sound. Yours, yours switched. You start. You sound like you're in a can to me. Oh, now I can't hear you. I don't know if other people can hear you. Uh, okay, still hearing Shane. I'll just talk about stuff. Um, <laughs> I'll do a I'll do a dance while David's. Uh, let's see. All right. So one of the things I wanted to talk about with the slim render is here. Uh, yeah. So to to kind of. Oh, there we go. To kind of to talk about the idea of what the Slim Renderers offer as well, I just wanted to kind of bring up the uh, kind of what what current how current renderers work. Um, so the current renderers across all the plat Android's really the only one that has kind of a Slim Renderer concept. But the way that all the renderers work across the platforms is that they all inherit because you know common base classes are nice, but you know inheritance is always problematic. Um, so the way it's implemented across the platforms uh, is that they all, all of them, all of the renderers are just implicitly wrapped. So there's an outer control that uh, that operates as the surface, and then 
and then am i still going through all right cool and then uh mm -hmm. yeah and then the i was just making sure so yeah so like if you look at the if you walk up this view renderer chain which is super fun you, you hit f12 for a while before you get to the <laughs> You get to the good stuff. There it is. It's a forms view group, which is it's just, it's basically just a view group. Um, forms view group is actually this this uh, a custom Java class that we wrote that's able to um, submit a bunch of data as a batch so that it reduces the amount of calls to the Java objects um, through the through kind of the the layer. So I don't. But yeah, it's basically just a view group. It, it's a for it's a um, it's an Android view group. So all forms controls, if you inspect them, are wrapped in like a view group and then the control. On UWP, it's a panel. On iOS, it's a UI view. So at one point, uh, I don't know, like four years ago or so, uh, the move started to go to sort of um, making four, it four more. Four years ago. I think it was five years ago. I don't remember. Fast, fast renders? renders? No, fast renders yeah. was like two years ago. Two, I don't know. I, it was before I, I was... joined three years ago. So I know that it wasn't before then. I don't know. Because it, no. it was before I worked here, I think. It, I think um, it yeah. So the idea here, uh, the idea, the promise with these, which was, um, I don't know anything about the hows or why of this, but the idea here was to take, <laughs> to make this more interface based. And then uh, use more composition opposed to inheritance. So the common behavior was extracted out to things like this visual element tracker uh, and stuff like that, the, that you could sort of pass these classes into. Um, it was only really realized for Android and kind of a small set of controls. So right there, uh, so Dave, before he cut out, was talking about uh, performance promises. So that's one of the things that the- Did you make um, those promises while I was unplugged? I didn't even get to hear. No, I didn't say anything about performance. I just figured oh. this is now sort of leading into it. <laughs> so this is one of the aspects of performance is that now there's going to be a lot less, uh, there's going to be a lot, a, lot, a lot fewer layers with everything. So, because currently in forms, you could basically- uh, indicate that every single control is wrapped in another control. So every single button on UWP is wrapped in a panel. Every single label on on uh, iOS is wrapped in a UI view. So this is going to dramatically condense down the visual tree a bunch. Uh, so it's it's going to create a standardized. It create the mat the slim renderers create a a really powerful way to uh, standardize this. Uh, in a, in, a, in a very nice way. And so a lot of that is also really enabled by multi-targeting. So the ability to uh, condense all of our projects into a single project uh, type, and then just through, uh, through you know, platform mappings, that, then we can, we can um, sort of reuse a lot of the code across the renderers. Because right now there's sort of this, there's a, there's like an assembly boundary sort of between your li between everything. So, you know, your iOS renderers can't really um, play in the same playground as the Android renderers. So uh, the multi-targeting is nice because you can kind of just gloop all that together and do a single DLL, uh, even, and then even kind of condense those together with uh, the common controls. Uh, which is nice. And then, um, yeah, and then so the Slim Renders uh, help standardize that so we can sort of bring that simplified, uh, thinner layer of renders to literally every single platform in a really in a really easy way. So a lot of it is just copy paste reorganization. So it's just take you'll, you'll kind of see that with some of the renders when we go over to it, a lot of it is just um, reorganizing uh, a lot of this stuff into more uh, into more natural places. So, like for example, if you look at any of the renderers, uh, the renderers all have these really gnarly if statements, um, which I mean, these should probably just be dictionaries or something anyway. But yeah. <laughs> so basically, the uh, the slim renderers take this concept here and cr and put it into a more reusable um, structure. That's uh, that that's definitely more reusable across all the platforms as well. So, because even as you start looking through this, you you kind of see 
uh, you know, like here, update font is private. Um, so, I mean, a lot of these kind of the whole point was to make these accessible. So here, for example, if they update max lines, you can't overwrite it. If the line break mode is, you can't over override it. If the update text is, you can't override it. Like what you can, what you can actually override inside a label render is fairly random. Like it's only these two, you know, you should be able to override everything. So that's like a big thing that the, uh, the mappers do. Um, and then it's cool because they do it functionally instead of through inheritance. So uh, inheritance is always a little bit limiting. But yeah, so that's kind of the renderer background with things. Um, so switching over to the mappers, let's see how detailed this is. So switching around to the mappers, the idea is that <clears throat> you basically have this property mapper uh, and all this really is, is it's really just a string dictionary. So this is this is just the string of the property. And then map background color is a is a is just a method that it's called. As you can see here, it's just a static method. So yeah, static. Um, but yeah, so then this is just defined on the iOS part of the platform. So the net standard one kind of defines this these uh, contracts. So it's kind of another way to do contract, which is neat. So describes these contracts. And then on each platform now, you define the static uh, property. So that's another nice thing about it too, is it's sort of all in. So once you add a new mapper, uh, you basically have to define it for every single platform. So yeah, that's that's nice. Uh, let's see, standardization of renders. I'm trying to, I'm, I haven't, what else did Stefan talk about here? All right, so that's sort of the, the, the core of some of those things. Yeah. But I, mean, I, I don't know of... if you actually just said this, Shane, but one of the things that I liked, um, so if you just said this, then I apologize. I was reading chat and things. Uh, with something like that entry render iOS or really anything that I want to add a property support for, right? I can create my own, call it whatever I want to. So you could actually have a whole series of mappers that give you a naming scheme that you prefer. I mean, you really could. Um, and then point those, map them to the native implementations, uh, almost creating a DSL, uh, domain-specific language, right? Isn't that what DSL stands for? Or, or the, uh, the kind of internet that some people get at their houses. Um, so I think that's pretty stinking cool. Like I added, um, what was it, line wrap support uh, or word wrapping to a label at some point. And it worked for the most part, but I was actually able to do it within my shared code project. Uh, and I didn't have to go create like several different files. I could do it l like literally right in my main class. So I was, I really liked that, even though that that's a horrible way to organize code. Um, it worked out really well. Cool. Back to you, back to you. In the studio. All right. So I figured I would pull up kind of the Maui.core stuff here. Uh, so this was, huh, yeah. So this is the, let me kind of pull up the dependencies here so you can kind of see um, what we're talking about here. So yeah, like here, if you look at the dependencies, you'll notice here that Maui.core has no dependencies. <laughs> you know, it doesn't depend on any sort of Maui type. It's, it's the, uh, it's the, um, the alpha, I guess, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so it's the it's the start. It's the it's basically has everything, but it doesn't have any of these external dependencies like form core or anything. So, and then what you do, these are kind of like the interfaces I was talking about here. Is you define these interfaces, which is the common contract for your UI elements uh, that just kind of describe common behavior parts. See. And this, this was some stuff that we recently did, sort of, this is like the, all the stuff that makes up a, I borrowed the name from UWP from now, but I don't know if we'll keep that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is, these are the interfaces that describe any visual element that's on the screen. Uh, and then if you look at, where are renderers here? Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, Rui did a good job of breaking all this stuff up here. Um, yeah, so now this is a nice thing too, especially about, uh, there's there's actually a, an issue on here as well. If anybody wants to comment, uh, Paul created an issue around single project yep. stuff. 
if anybody's curious to sort of chime in on some of the single project conversation. Uh, but the way we did it in the first one, this is, I don't know, one of the ways I like it, um, is that everything sort of groups by functionality. So it's pretty cool because you could just go in here and see button. Cool. All right. So here's all the implementations of button. Uh, here's the Android implementation. Here's just the net standard one uh, that kind of defines the mappers. Here's the, uh, and it's all done through partials. So as you can see, it's just a partial button renderer. And then the, the, the rest of the implementation is then satisfied by um, each platform to kind of fill in the, the different mappers. So, so yeah, so it's neat because you just, you just create the, um, looks like this one's just mapping into the text property. But uh, yeah, so you create the button mapper. Here's your, uh, your functions here which then, uh, this one's just super basic. It's just setting like the text on button. I should probably grab one that has a little more custom behavior. Let's do an entry render. Does that have a little bit more behavior on the, yeah, okay, cool. Entry render is a little more interesting. So with like entry render, you create the entry mapper here, and then here's the methods. If you look, the net standard implementation here is just empty. So, you know, those are the, um, yeah, that's what makes it, lets it compile. But yeah, so then the Android implementation now has this consistent naming scheme here with your, you know, map property color, map property placeholder. Um, yeah, so it kind of, it creates this nice cohesive way of uh, defining all the way the properties are mapping. And if you look, the, and if you look, this is all against the interfaces. So, you know, it's all against an iText input here. And that's it. So it, when the when the when forms. So I think. Let me see what we did here. So this is this is a different version of forms that we've sort of where we've inverted the dependencies. This isn't the one in the direct Maui repository, but you'll see this forms core has a reference to Maui.core. And now if we go into the, some of this stuff, let's go into entry. Does entry have? the infra interface on it. All right, let's just do button. I'm not sure which one of these uh, we took the stuff off of. Uh, I button, yeah, here we go. So here's like the Maui implementation here, I button. And then, um, yeah, and then so this is a forms implementation of a button. So you'll see that this, this button here still works on bindable layout. And then the, Implementation, let's see where are some stuff here. Yeah, I button, I'm just kind of looking for, yeah, so you can see now that this is just, this is mapping, um, see like this clicked here, this is coming from the renderer. Um, so like the renderer will call clicked on the I button because the renderer has a copy of I button. Um, and then I was trying to see, let's see, do we have any other interesting ones? The I checkbox. Yeah. All right. So if we look at like the the checkbox, where's our checkbox renderer here? Um, yeah. So you'll see here it's just um, uh, when the checks changed, it's setting on I on I on the virtual view. So the virtual view is the interface, as you can see here, do, 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 and it sets it back on the I button, which then propagates up to the uh, up to the view. Up to the implement up to the UI detailed implementation. So um, yeah, does that kind of cover it, Dave? Are there some more aspects of the? I was looking the, for one the, of my uh, my examples that I had written, and I don't have the code here. I was going to show. Um, let me see if I can, because I think some of this stuff was pulled through. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, hold on. Renderer. Here we go. I think this is what I'm looking for. So I'm basically just looking for the way, let's see, at what level is this implemented? Whoops. Oh, yeah. Visual element has a partial class in there. So basically, I'm just looking for where the renderer properties are set up. OK, here we go. Yeah. So what happens is, when the visual element is created, uh, 
the the Maui core. So this is this is one of the the interesting details here is now uh, now visual element. So the forms element knows about the renderer, uh, whereas in like the other form stuff that it, it, the forms elements never really knew about the renderers. So um, yeah, so that's where kind of that inversion I was talking about happens. And then let's see, I'm looking for the property change. Here we go. So then the way that works is that on the visual element, here's our on property change. So again, this is just the forms implementation. Uh, MVU and Blazor would have some other way of propagating this down. But on the form side, when on property change fires, which fires from the bindable object, it calls update value and update value is just a is just a method on the interface here um, and then this is then propagated down to the mapper here let's see let's kind of dive into so this is this is it has a reference to basically this um, so it has a reference to this like this renderer and then let's see I was just gonna grab update value update value here. Yeah, so the renderer now calls into here, which is update value. And then the mapper is sort of your dictionary here that the properties um, all get all get propagated to. So that's kind of how that works with sort of like the top down with the with sort of the inversion of that mm -hmm. uh, is that now you can use the renderers more directly from any sort of UI context. Um, I don't know why that just opened. Oh, I guess I accidentally started building my solution between hitting F buttons. <laughs> That's, That's funny. really funny. I don't even know it builds. All right, let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so, so while while you're building, um, okay. uh, that's fast. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Is this a, is this a gallery? Yeah. So this is kind of yeah. I love this Bob blah blah. Um, I don't know who actually put that one in, but that's pretty awesome. Bob, um, <laughs> Yeah, so this little is... little Rusted Development reference. Yeah. <laughs> hey, there's money in the banana stand. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, so that's, that's I think they're using this. No, 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 that's not you. I don't think that's using these samples. Um, I wasn't even sure if this stuff was hooked up, but I think it's this one's actually going straight through main activity. Um, yeah, so this... We have content page hooked up through here. Um, so yeah, so this is basically, let's see, where's our native view? Just trying to see what this one was all based on. I think it's based on this dummy layout, um, but I don't know, whatever. The interesting part <laughs> is that you can kind of look at this to see some, this is sort of our scrap code here where we were sort of playing with some of the behavior. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the neat stuff you can see here is that like this is just a forms app. So this is just forms application. Um, and then if you look, you can kind of inject custom behavior here for your platforms kind of inline, which is neat. So your search commands, let's see if this is all actually wired up to the right stuff. Is it? Click me. I don't know which one the search command is on here. <laughs> um, which one's the search bar? Let's see, where's our switch? Maybe do the switch? No? I might even be clicking on the wrong view <laughs> that's not even hooked up to it's this. It's all squigglies, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, let's see. Let's look for blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's in there. I'm not sure which one of these these are hooked up to. Um, oh, I'm not on iOS. I'm an idiot. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> this is, see, this is how if that's... defs get you, man. <laughs> yeah. That was the demo. It was showing you how that code didn't run. <laughs> yeah, Clancy. Clancy uh, yeah. sees it. He's he's just a he's a couple seconds behind. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Uh, yeah. So the idea, but that's the idea here. So that, I mean, that's through it through it through a roundabout way. I demoed the way these if defs work. So um, yeah, I mean, these will kind of cater to however you want to implement these. But it's neat because you can, excuse me, you can just. Uh, you don't have to, a lot of the behavior we're trying to also do the slim renderer is limiting as much as you possible limiting as much as we can forcing you to have to implement a custom renderer. So the hope is that you'll be able to have any native extension point that you would need. Uh, you'll just be able to do by, um, you know, through these if defs or by tapping into the mappers. Yeah. 
Cool. So I, I want to ask some questions. I'm going to flip over to our, our interview mode here. Doo -doo -doo, cool transition, interview mode. All right, so I have some questions about this. So um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. I want to know how you feel about this. Um, so you've been working in Xamarin Forms for years, uh, initially as a contractor, right? Contributor, and then hired onto the team. Now you have been saddled with the joy and pleasure of maintaining Xamarin Forms for a couple of years now. Um, and and you're and you're now seeing these architectural proposals. Um, kind of, what's your take on it? Uh, are are you liking what you're seeing? I mean, obviously, it sounds like you're advocating for it. I'm hearing positive vibes. Um, I don't think you're just towing a particular line. But like, can can I just tell me a little bit about how you feel? Yeah, I mean, it's it's nice to you know, because for like you said, forms has been around for what now, like six years, seven, six years. Yep. Um, so yeah, I mean, I had first, I remember I, I first used forms, even just version 1.0 when it came out. Um, and then even at version, that first version, I was, uh, I messed with it a little bit, but then still kind of just stayed native with everything. Um, and then, yeah, it wasn't really until 2.0 and such that I really started diving in and using it. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of things have evolved in the world since then. So, you know, different language paradigms and things that people want to use different ui paradigms and things people want to use um and then a lot of things haven't a lot of things have grown i think less they've just sort of been developed on instead of um ar architected kind of for a um you know kind of for a for a nice structure like that's kind of what a lot of the renderer stuff is doing because any of the renderer stuff is always super painful like anytime somebody ha like even now uh if I have to create a custom renderer, I always grumble about it because it's so it's such it's so frustrating to just do all the syntax. Um, I mean, I think only even last year I was familiar with how to even write the export attribute. You know, like I think finally after doing forms for three or four years and working for two years, I can do one without looking. Yeah. Um, I always mix up the types every time. Yeah, I always, absolutely, I always reverse that. them. Yeah. I always reverse them because I always thought handler should be the renderer and then the other one should be the uh, the type. But yeah, I just always mess those things up. So um, creating it, let, kind of stripping away the magic because magic sometimes is good if it's subtle enough that it, it doesn't not hiding too much from you. Um, but kind of stripping some of that away and uh, providing kind of these better hooks. And so, and I mean, I'm always a big fan of anything that's, that's, uh, that's, it's more function oriented and more composition oriented. Mm -hmm. So the idea of being able to hook into the mappers uh, and things like that is really cool. So there's even these, I don't know if they're part of this repository. Um, uh, I'm, I don't even know how they're, how it's spelled. There, there were these render overrides. I don't even know if it's part of this repository, but for example, Clancy was demoing this um, where you could basically set like a render override uh, and then in line, kind of a, rend a renderer that you want to replace on on like a on like a picker or something of that nature. So I don't think is that part of this? No, it's not. Um, I was trying to see if it was, but yeah, it just there's there's a lot more. Um, I think there's there's a little there's a little less cognitive dissonance there with people being able to do stuff, um, especially new developers coming in. Once we can kind of start lighting up some of the the single project stuff within the IDE. That I think that'll really start to elevate um, how users are going to implement things. So, you know, because for example, you could implement this search command all in partial classes. You know, you could change this if you're not a, if you're not a fan of the if defing. You know, you could do something like this and say create search commands, and then in all in each of your platforms, this could just define a totally different command. You know, so it's um, yeah. I mean, it's the way. Third-party libraries have been building things for you know five or six years, <laughs> is is basically just like this. So being able to elevate that to the platform level is really cool. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Yeah, and then just making it all the same. <laughs> you know, that's the big thing. I mean, all the renderers. What do you mean by the same? So yeah. What do you mean by the same? Uh, all the renderer stuff. So just this. Let's air, um, air our dirty laundry. Let let everybody in the. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't something that, that most like, of them need to 
concern themselves with on a day to day basis. But for contributors and maintainers, this is a annoying. Yeah, all this stuff. So being able to just this idea of these mappers, you know, that you know you have this mapper, you can set whatever property on here. So this was something like James was showing, you know, for example, you could just set some property here. Like if you wanted to extend the mapper, you could just add uh, onto it and just add some other property you want, um, you know, cats, and then, you know, map property cats. And then now on your, uh, on, on the, on the, on your checkbox or whatever, uh, if you propagate down cats, it'll just call onto your mapper function, you know? So it's, it just has a really nice behavior of, um, of being consistent. So you literally know if you have a checkbox and you know how to interact with it, then you know how to interact with the button, you know how to interact with everything else. It's, 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 yeah. it's very common. And then another thing to quickly highlight, kind of we were on the topic, um, the inheritance here with the view renderer, mm -hmm. this is just an empty wrapper. So it's not the same idea. So like if I follow this implementation up, uh, you'll see that it eventually just hits interfaces. Yeah, see, it basically just hits interfaces. So mm -hmm. it's not, this is just a, it's more, this is more like, a, I guess, a render factory or something like that. You could think of it uh, for creating the types. Um, yeah, which is nice too, because you can override stuff like with the view creating. Uh, I know like, like for example, right now on a renderer, you can't influence the creation of a renderer. Uh, very well. So like the renderer just gets created and now you're stuck with this view group, um, but you can't like inject property and things into it. Whereas this, this lets you do that more easily. Mm. Um, yeah. So that's, and then, yeah, so that's very nice. And then I think I was trying to see, this is one of those things I should have tested a little bit before. Um, live coding. We don't test before live coding. <laughs> yeah. Did that just get named weird? Oh, I guess I got named weird. Yeah. All right. Look, why is it called button mapper? Here I'm talking about consistent naming, and one of the namings is wrong. Oh, <clears throat> uh, that's yeah, copy and paste, right? Because this is probably called date picker mapper. Yeah. All right. That's just funny. This should be checkbox mapper, but I'm not going to change that. But yeah, the mappers are neat because you can kind of. And this is the big demo that Clancy likes to show. Um, I keep losing where I was. I got distracted by the poorly named mapper. Uh, get, let me do a different. Clancy says, "Get blame Rui." <laughs> All right, let me go to one that makes more sense. Button mapper. So the button mappers are cool because it, it has all these neat behaviors here, um, where you can just replace. Because it's at the core, it's just. Let me kind of go up on property mapper. Where is it? See, it's just a. It's it's basically just like a dictionary. So, you know, you can define, I'm trying to remember the syntax. Hopefully I remember the syntax. Does it take syntax? Yeah, there you go. See, you can, you can influence a, uh, so you can influence it at a few different levels. So this is one of the common examples he likes. So he compares it to debug rainbow, for example, like the debug rainbow does this cool thing where it highlights, it creates a border thing around everything. Um, so what you could do is you can do, I think, uh, let's see, what's the base class on this called? There's a common, you can use the common renderer. Clancy's chat. Uh, is it? Yeah, I'm just trying to see if it's the view renderer. Yeah, view mapper. There it is. So the view mapper, for example, is a common, uh, is the common mapper that everybody shares here. So, yeah. So, yeah. So what you can do now is like, so this, these functions here are implemented, are, are, are part of every single element. So because he it's sort of this like decorator pattern type thing. So for example, the the button mapper uh, ingests the view mapper. Um, and then you can sort of just you can keep kind of decorating it up if you want. But every single view has this view mapper. So like what you can do is you could basically say view mapper and now let's say I want to influence background color. You could take the background color here and create a function. I don't remember what the types are, so hopefully this is right. Uh, yay, no red squigglies. Uh, and then this now is your view renderer, 
and your view. So your view is your common, I is your um, whatever the view is. So like a button or something like that. And then your IView renderer is of course, like whatever the implementation is. So what kind of, I forget what kind of properties this has, but yeah, see now you can basically call any of these properties on it. Um, and then that's going to now affect every single view that exists there. So you can kind of do the same thing with like a button mapper, a uh, button renderer has a button mapper. You can take like the text property here uh, and then and then kind of influence it in the same fashion. So now every time the text property fires, uh, you can uh, you can do something something different if you want. Mm, so you can really hook into so, any part. Now when you hook into it like that, is that you may have already said this, I apologize. Is that only going to capture it when it's being set? Is it anytime it's being touched? Yeah, it's anytime that it's being set. So okay. anytime that a that a tech the text property is being propagated from the into the eye view. Okay. Basically. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So anytime the because if we go to button mapper, so I button text here. Anytime it's propagating um, here. So this was kind of that's I guess that sort of finishes the loop if we look at it. Uh, so if we go to visual element here, the on property change, this will fire a text, which called update value. Update value is what's calling in the abstract view renderer, which is the renderers. That then looks through the dictionary for something that matches the string.text value, and then it calls the function. Mm -hmm. So, and you could even do inline, there's, I don't think this branch has it, um, but like one of the things you could do here, for example, like let's say you created a custom button. Um, let's say you had some sort of custom button up here, like that, you could, you could check behavior here and say, okay, if Y is my button, then do this, else, you know, continue on your merry way. So mm -hmm. you could even create sort of deviating behavior in this fashion. There's just kind of a lot of different ways, whatever sort of fits your style uh, with the way that you want to do it. Um, and then I don't remember the exact syntax, but I, I think one example was um, you could, that Clancy has is you, ha you could do like a render or override on it and then provide sort of like a different renderer onto a, a particular, maybe it's because I'm not doing it as like an instance member. No, I, it's not part of this branch. All right. Yeah, where you could provide it, an, a hook right here. So, you know, it just enables a lot of different scenarios. Um, once you sort of have that cohesion with the renders, um, yeah. And then so, I think, because these are all static, right? All right. Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, this is, <laughs> I'm like, I'm just typing... Yeah. All well, right. this is so how this people is code, example. man. This is perfect. Yeah. So this is cool because see what I'm basically doing here, because this is a static, is I'm saying, okay, if it's not of type my button, just call uh, call the normal static property that does the normal behavior. So this is the set this is a sim this is a similar idea to overriding, but it's doing it a little more functionally. Mm -hmm. So this is basically the same thing as doing like override map property text. Uh, and then kind of changing the behavior based on your button element. So, yeah, and then here you could, for example, do your if deaths uh, for for different behavior based on 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 how you wanted it to run. So, if if I were doing this in Xamarin Forms, how would I have to do this? Yeah, so like in Xamarin Forms, for example, if you were to do this, the um, I think I closed all my tabs, but. Uh, I gotta figure out how to, if you can kill this preview. Can you kill this preview when you're alt tabbing? I have no idea. <laughs> I just care because I remember the first time I was streaming, I had a bunch of stuff on my right window I didn't want people to see, and then I alt tab, and I'm like, oh wait, <laughs> they can see it anyway. <laughs> yeah, they can show up anyway. Um, yeah, so I mean, in the normal forms world, uh, I thought I had a window open that was the form source. Yeah. So in the normal kind of forms world, um, oh, I guess I could actually just start from the demo. That would be more useful, wouldn't it? So um, I have too many windows open. There's the demo. Yeah. So normal code, you know, you have to you have to go to and this is you you have to go to the platform here, mm -hmm. uh, add your my button renderer like this. I'm, and then, I'm, I'm already sad. I'm already sad yeah, because you, what you here. just showed me was like eight lines of code in the yeah. in the complex yeah. example. 
Yeah. So actually, what you would do is you would Google how to pick that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and then Google you just with Bing. Bing with Google. What would you do? Oh yeah, you Bing it. <laughs> you would Bing it. So you would basically. Oh oh no. And then this gets more fun. Then you type button render, and you're like, well, which button render do I implement? Do I implement <laughs> this fast render one? Do I do this app compat one? Do I do this other one? Like, I don't really know. Like, I want a fast app, so I'm going to do the you're fast selling, one. You're selling me on the Xamarin Forms <laughs> way of doing this, I, I tell you. I, like, oh, and then, and then it's all green? Why is it green? Oh, I have to add an obsolete? Okay, add an obsolete. That's the right thing to do, right? Why does it have obsolete code? I don't understand why Forms makes me do obsolete code. <laughs> oh, man. It made sense at one point, I'm sure. But, yeah, did, you know, no, when we first started, we only had one set of Android renderers, right? So we just happened to yeah. have... You know, we, we have to follow Android moving forward. Felipe says he would go to Stack Overflow. All right. Well, before we, I think we should probably, let me look at the time here. We've been going for an uh, hour and 20. I'm going to, uh, let's let's answer a few questions that have come up. Um, and while right. I'm doing this, you can actually get rid of any yellow bars in your Visual Studio where it tells you to disable hot reload or something. Pierce says that the gold bar is driving him bananas. It's blinding him. <laughs> yeah, you won't have it in this one. So I don't know where you're sorted, Sam. I didn't get a sort also. I, I poked Pierce about it a while ago. It's probably because we nice, slacked Sam. off and didn't tell the right people. <laughs> Do I have a sword yet? Oh, is this uh, on me? your on your handle, huh? I, I, I don't think I have one either, so whatever. Yeah, Sam and I don't get swords. Gosh, you guys, gamers. I tell you, you always worrying about your swords. Um... So a couple of questions that I've seen come through the chat, and I apologize, I don't remember who asked for them. Um, but what is the story for uh, Windows in MAUI, in .NET MAUI? So um, currently, we're kind of in a, in a bit of a, a watching pattern uh, to see how things are going to develop, right? Because things are moving forward and changing in the Windows space in terms of um, they've just shipped a WinUI 3 Preview 1, I believe, uh, at Build. So that's very exciting. Break, Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go do go do your thing. Uh, and as a matter of fact, when he's doing that, I can switch to, I can switch to another view. Oh man, these transitions are so cool. Um, so congratulations to the WinUI team for shipping the preview. That's very cool, very exciting. Um, of course, what we have today in Xamarin Forms is UWP. That's what we support. And uh, the transition from UWP to WinUI 3 um, will be a little bit of namespace changes, a little bit of refactoring, but really it's a pretty straightforward transition to be able to take that platform and to move it forward there. However, um, there are dependencies and there are other things that need to happen um, before we would be able to, as .NET MAUI, take that uh, take that work on. Some of that is making sure that it gets lit up on .NET 5, .NET 6. That work is yet to be done. Um, it is it is being done. Um, the Windows team is underway on that. And so, you know, there's there's certain things that we just can't do yet from from the .NET MAUI standpoint. And so we'll we'll let that stuff play out. Uh, project um, starts with a starts with an R. What was it? Their the the announcement. They came out with a new name for something that had never been used in any of the meetings. Reconcile, resolve. Where is it? It's in the chat. Somebody remind me. You guys are like 15 seconds behind me, so. Project. All right, it's cool. It's a cool name. I thought it was a pretty cool name when I heard it. Um, reunion. Thank you, Dan. Oh, goodness. So Project Reunion, uh, very cool. I'm excited for that. I think that having a single Windows platform and you know, not having to answer, okay, well, is it this flavor? Is it that flavor? Is it run on this? Does it run on that? Which device does it run on? Oh, it runs on this device, not on that device. Um, that would be really great. I mean, that's part of what we're, we're doing with 1.NET, right? Is we're unifying, making it simple. <laughs> I don't know what that is, Lachlan, but it sounds amazing. I used to listen to a, a band, and they had an they had an album called the Ragamuffin Band. It's a good album from way back in the '90s, man. So, um, so that's kind of where we stand with with Windows. Uh, WPF, there is a back end for that for Xamarin Forms. It's community contributed, community maintained. Uh, we've done a little bit of upkeep on it. Um, it's an option. It's possible. Um, and if that's something that is of use, you know, we want to know from developers what your demand is, what your need is, um, because that's heavily where our focus is. It's customer focus, it's developer focus. What what do you need help with? Um, and how can we help you there? 
so I saw another question, what platforms will .NET MAUI support? Uh, so it's Windows, Mac OS, Android, iOS, right? Um, so a big transition for us or a focus for us will be creating parity on our desktops, on our desktop platforms to, to really support the things that desktop apps need. Um, we are definitely interested in and watching what's happening with Catalyst from Apple, which is the ability to take an existing iOS application, whether for iPad or for phone, um, and run that on the desktop as a desktop application. Um, that's all very interesting, and we're watching that closely to see when is the right time for us, uh, if that time comes, to support that. And that's, again, driven by uh, developer demand customers, as well as understanding what, what the capacity is and what we can deliver at the quality standard that we need to do that for. Um, if my moderators can ping me with any other questions, I will answer them at this time. I heard Shane's back. I can see him in the background doing things on his computer. <laughs> no, I didn't go for a beer. I am here. Other questions? Tizen. Uh, you know, Tizen is Samsung supported, and Tizen has been, uh, I guess they run on .NET Core already. Um, and so I think that they're in a really good state to make this transition to .NET 5, .NET 6. And... Um, haven't spoken to them very recently about this, but I anticipate that they are they are on board with making that transition with us. So that's that's but that's really up to the Samsung Tizen team. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw this, but they shipped shell support for watch uh, for their circular UI for Samsung watches, which I think is pretty awesome. Uh, Almir, which strategy the team will use to support both Xamarin Forms and MAUI with new features? Uh, interesting to see. Yeah, won't it be? <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's a couple things for us to work out in the very near future in terms of supporting uh, the two repositories during this period of transition, as well as during the, the, the year of support while MAUI, uh, .NET MAUI is shipping and, and, be, and gaining adoption. So, uh, you know, we've got really 18 months between now. I keep saying 18. I haven't really done the, the actual math, so somebody can correct me on this. But between now and November 2021, um, for us to, to get .NET MAUI ready to go, ready to ship, uh, go through our previews, and, and then launch it, right? Um, and then uh, from that point on, we've got another 12 months of support for that release, that final Xamarin Forms 6 release of of Xamarin Forms. So, you know, we're going to need to have some overlap. Right now, the thinking is, is that we will work uh, feverishly over the summer period and into the fall to get as many PRs tidied up as possible and into Xamarin Forms because uh, if it makes sense, and we'll certainly talk to the contributors and to customers and developers, um, those are, you know, important enough that people want to be able to use them now. Um, and then oh, as, we, as we go further into this period of transition, the work will focus on stability, uh, bug fixes, fundamentals, things like that, and some of the refactoring that will set the stage for this transition. Um, you know, we don't want to bring code over necessarily or maintain code that's obsoleted and isn't going to be going away. So uh, for those things, I recommend looking at the GitHub issues that are open, the specs from the team that propose some of the uh, refactorings as well as some of the uh, deprecations and removals. Um, so, you know, there's definitely going to come a point where we're going to say, look, it doesn't make sense to take feature uh, requests into Xamarin Forms now that the transition is much nearer. So, and it could be a case by case basis. Um, we're certainly not going to just, you know, stick our fingers in our ears and not help, help you. Um, but, you know, let's retarget those things at .NET MAUI. We will be shipping .NET MAUI previews. Right. So later this year, we hope to, to start that. And then throughout 2021, you'll be getting builds from us on the regular. So um, that's something to look forward to as well. You could really start to hopefully be making use of those. Um, let's see. I think I saw a couple other questions come through. Do I understand correctly that .NET MAUI will not run on mono? That is incorrect. Um, it will run on the mono runtime that is unified into .NET 5, .NET 6. That's the more appropriate way to say it. It has a runtime moniker. Um, and I have, I have, at that point, exhausted my ability to speak to that topic. 
Um, but that is for the platforms that need it, right? That is, it's really, you can think of it at that point as what is the .NET runtime for that particular device architecture. Um, you won't necessarily need to worry about it being mono or not mono. Dun, 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 dun. I prefer to think of mono. Highlander, there can be only one. Absolutely perfect reference. Thank you very much. Um, Shane, are you a Highlander fan? I, I don't know. Have Not you ever watched? Him. Well, to say yeah, fan is I probably mean, overselling <laughs> the series, right? I feel like it's it's like a requirement to have actually seen it. Hey, how is yeah, the video I quality for everybody it. else, by the way? Because it's looking pretty janky on my desktop. Okay, uh, Swack Attack says that Amorium, Amorium Rob has a question. Is it possible to integrate .maui apps into native apps? Absolutely. So um, in the same way that you can do Xamarin Forms native embedding, you'll be able to do .NET MAUI native embedding. And as a matter of fact, um, something I'm pushing for, and I probably need to write this spec myself, is I want to see more fine green control of that embedding. And I'm hopeful personally hopeful that this new renderer architecture will facilitate that. Some of those things are more difficult. So like right now, you can take a content page and you can embed that into an Android iOS app, uh, UWP app, WP app, any of the platforms that we support, you can embed forms views into them. Um, and we definitely want to uh, continue that path. As a matter of fact, you know, anecdotally, when you hear, hey, uh, this team in Microsoft is using React Native, in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, when you ask them how they're using it, they're using it in this exact way. They're embedding a piece of functionality into an otherwise C, C++ application. Um, and you know, we can do the same thing. We can improve that story. Um, and for those who choose to use .NET in those cases, we can be ready for them. Video is crispy clear. Sweet. Good. It's just my screen, which is fine because I'm the one broadcasting. Thank you, John, for confirming. Looks good. Dun, 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 dun. Fork the Mauer repo already. Hope to find some time. Yeah, I saw on Twitter that you'd done that, Almir. And you know, for everybody watching, be aware that the uh, that the .NET Maui repo is essentially a copy of Xamarin Forms and a rename of the namespaces. Um, a lot of change is going to end up coming through. Um, no promises. We might come blow it away and start over. Um, but uh, we, we're working through that. But, you know, it gives you an indication of the starting point. Um, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we blow it away. Um, but uh, it is a starting point. It shows the progress. The issues are probably more important at this point to show the uh, intention and the, the strategy. There's also a roadmap, too, for those interested. Okay. Shane, you ready to start doing some live coding? Yeah, we can switch to that. All right, cool. I'm going to come to your desktop. And uh, so I think some of the things that we wanted to kind of get into, um, app bars, tab views with shell, service locator, where would you like to start? Let's see. How are we doing on time? Oh, we got like good. We got at least an hour okay. and a half. Wasn't okay. sure. Not at least. We should start from a little less. All right. We'll just, we'll just build stuff up. And if we start running out of time, I'll switch to already kind of build stuff. <laughs> All right. I'm going to let you run with this for a bit. I'm going to do my, my break and I will be right back. All right. Cool. So this is some of the stuff that's sort of come, that's come across the table with, uh, with Maui. Um, so one of the example, one of, let me bring up the issue here. So one of the issues um, which we've had some back and forth conversation on, uh, and I know that there's some interest here, is, is if we want to if we want to tie Xamarin Forms into uh, Maui. <laughs> I gotta have someone like hit my fingers every time I say Xamarin Forms now, right? Uh, yeah, kind of. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Clancy. Um, yeah, so one of the things that we've talked about, uh, James did a really cool, I would post a link, but I don't have a sword, so I can't post a link. So maybe somebody else can post it. Uh, he did a really cool demo here, basically wiring in the Microsoft extensions points. Um, so this is all the stuff you see like in ASP.NET Core. Uh, and then it's also generic, so you can do this at Core apps as well. 
Uh, it's all sort of extracted out to these sort of generic types. So one of the things that we're looking at is like how how can we tie into this behavior? Like what can we do to enable these types of this type of scenario? So a few things that this helps enable. Uh, one, it causes it to be um, a little more cohesive with the whole .NET story. So people coming in from the web or from other sort of net core backgrounds, this is going to be kind of a, a familiar uh, programming model for them, uh, especially for their app startup. Uh, so this will be a really neat, especially once we get down to a single project syntax, so that you basically have like a single application that's representing all your different platforms, uh, which would which will be really neat. So. Yeah, so this this is kind of neat. So we're sort of demonstrating. Uh, there's a lot of features you kind of get for free once you pull this in. So for example, um, app setting stuff you get. So maybe you could just set up a development setting. Um, this probably app settings can do the private stuff too, can it? Like you have a private store, so you could do stuff like storing keys in here for local development. Uh, put those keys somewhere else on the server once you're sort of compiling. Uh, the host builder setup has nice features for configuring uh, a lot of sort of default behavior you get. So you get these this uh, familiar behavior with logging uh, configurations and, and such, and then also sort of the service configuration. So the service configuration is what plays into um, really just being able to tap into the pipeline. So it kind of makes, makes the whole, for, it makes the whole Maui startup process more pipeline driven opposed to just kind of being a little bit random. So like right now with forms, you know, there's all the stuff, uh, make sure you call this after forms init, make sure you do this, make sure this part of code, this this block of code here is here inside the, inside the block, you know? So like if you go to a main activity, um, you know, there's this very, there's this very, uh, specific um, ceremony here. So if like all of this could be condensed, inverted, condensed more into sort of this builder concept, uh, so there's there's kind of a better um, organization of those things, you know, that would help kind of the consistent story. So that's one of the things we're looking at. Uh, the other thing here is really wiring in your dependencies. So this is, this is something a lot of people use like, um, you know, autofac or other things. Um, I think autofac is one of the, the bigger ones these days. But yeah, so basically, uh, for Netcore ships with its own dependency service. So one thing that we're looking at is like, should we use that? So like, if we use the dependency service that comes with it, uh, there's a lot of cool stuff you just get. So you get the constructor injection. Um, yeah, constructor injection, basically a full featured DI platform. Uh, yeah, so you can see kind of James has sort of wired up a lot of this behavior here. Uh, yeah, so there's adding the singletons, adding the transients, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, so that's, so yeah, so this is, I did kind of some demos. Uh, we'll see if I can build this up. So I started from James's sample uh, when I was I was messing around with some shell things. Um, but there's a lot of neat scenarios this also has. So, the, the cool thing, the cool scenarios that this enables is if you, because like a DI container by itself is pretty boring, you know, like there's, it's not really that exciting just saying, hey, you can have this DI container. Like it only becomes interesting once you pull the thread of that container through the implementation, so through forms. Um, so for example, one of the neat places we could start, this is kind of the stuff I was showing, well, I'll be showing it like with shell, like shell right now, basically anywhere in forms where you see activator.create instance, it should just change that out with, it should just change that out with service provider.get. Because what that does is that, that, that allows, that basically means everything just gets created through the service provider, which gives you a really cool hook into things. So for example, your data templates, you could spec, for example, on your data template, you could specify an interface. And then the data, the data. If you had an interface registered to that type, it could, it would then sort of create it. So that's what I, I have this sort of shell example that I've built um, that I'll build up 
Uh, but yeah, so it's kind of all these, this is sort of like your baked in constructor in injection. Um, but yeah, so like how much can we sort of pull this thread through forms is, is I think the more of the exciting part. Uh, Cause that's what's neat about like the web stuff, you know, is that you have your controllers and the controllers are all created from service provider, which then causes things to be injected. Um, so everything is sort of, created from there. And then another thing I was curious, I don't know if this is possible, but I was wondering, I'd have to talk to Stefan about this, is like, is there some way we could do this with the XAML as well? So like if you define a content page mm -hmm. and then on that content page, you define a constructor that has all these interfaces, you know, could we make it so when that, um, when that page is created from XAML that it will just inject some stuff in? I don't know, what did, what maybe did we can. What did he say? Maybe that's, I didn't ask him yet. <laughs> Well, that's awesome I because I actually asked him too. Yeah. Um, I did a similar experiment and then I realized that I ran into that problem that you're describing there that I can't can't really do that. Um, at least from yeah, the I don't side. Know. Yeah, I don't know how hard that is, but I don't I was just, because like I was saying, I was just trying to think of cool ways to just really um, pull it through. Because if, if we don't, if, if Maui doesn't <coughs> internally utilize the iService provider, then it's it's kind of pointless to 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 implement it, you know. So yeah, so some of the questions there are some of the things we need to measure with performance, because um, the implementation is is just against interfaces, you know. Like I service collection is your um, registration container, and then I service provider is the concrete um, IOC container. So like, uh, you know, should we should we just take our dependency service? And use that because that dependency service is super fast because it's super simple. Um, so there's a, some performance measurements we want to do because especially in you know on web you don't really care about that startup performance. So like when you're doing performance testing on web and things like that, you'll always um, you'll always fire you'll always like run the performance test once without actually testing anything because you need everything to warm up and then you test everything. But like for mobile stuff, that warm up is like the only thing we care. It's the main thing we care about, you know. Like the warm up is the biggest thing we need to make sure isn't causing any performance. Like yeah, mm -hmm. the DI container might be fast after the warm up, but if it's adding like half a second to startup, then it doesn't matter how fast it is. So in my tests, it was pretty fast. Uh, it was around twenty milliseconds for the startup on it, um, but that might be. But I haven't pinned down exactly what uh what that is so um yeah i don't know i need to put peppers on some of that but Gotta put yeah some pepper so that's, on it that's for sure yeah <laughs> so um yeah so let's see if i can pull i have let's see if i can pull enough of this together uh to wire this up so the oh uh, the extension that extension one is the one i want it's the yes. right it's hosting isn't it uh there let's is a I hosting I think hosting is the main one with like the builder. Yeah, okay. So one implementation we could do, so right now I'm not doing this because I'd have to build everything, is that we could just take a dependency on hosting.abstractions. Um, and then if we just did hosting.abstractions, then everything is just interface driven at that point. Um, see, hosting is an actual is an actual concrete implementation of, abs of dot abstractions. So that's another thing we're gonna kind of look at is, um, you know, it'll still be replaceable regardless of what way we do it. So this more matters on our internal side of, of, of how we want it all to kind of wire together. So, cool, cool, cool. Anyway, so yeah, pull that in. I might reference James's blog here a few times because I was looking at I was looking at some of his code, or I'll just put it on my second screen, and you guys will think I'm doing it myself. <laughs> Well, I think, uh, if, as I recall, and I don't think James is here with us, but uh, as I recall, he and Glenn Condren, I believe, worked through this together because he was learning at the same time what the possibilities were, and that's where this all okay. came from, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's there's also some discussion, too, because we don't want, we don't want this to create a barrier of entry for people um, because, you know, if you have to create this entire... If, if, you know, if someone coming in to forms looks at this and they have to, you know, they have this whole start loop thing that they need to make, they need to define, um, you know, that might be a little bit daunting. Um, and this really isn't even something, I think a lot of the builder stuff comes into play more aggressively on the web 
because the web especially has a lot heavier configuration stuff that you're doing, like ports and HTTPS and auth providers and all of these things. So um, this will start enabling those scenarios, though. Like, what if Essentials pulls in their auth provider here for their web stuff, and then you could just register that, you know, and then that would somehow enable some scenario. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Just thinking out loud. But that would be neat. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, that's the thing is kind of just what what can we reuse? Like how much how much on the back of the of what's already been built in the net core stuff? Can we just jump right in and use uh, in, instead of inventing the, reinventing the wheel? Um, so, yeah. All right. So let's we'll kind of walk through this in a similar fashion as um, to kind of follow the ASP.NET model. So the ASP.NET model. Uh, has has a startup class. So this is going to be where we uh, define our init here. All right. So and I'm just I'm just borrowing from not borrowing from anyone. I'm, I, this is all from memory. <laughs> <laughs> just ignore the just... second. There's no second screen. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, Those who yeah. can do this from memory are the exception, not the rule. <laughs> yeah, I haven't done this. In, I know I've done. I did a lot of this like three or four years ago, so I'm very familiar with it all. But it's not at my fingertips anymore. Um, so yeah, I mean, some of the stuff I I definitely um, yeah. So and then I'm just gonna grab James's host here because no one wants to see me pipe that thing out. But I can kind of talk through it as I as I pull it together here. Um, yeah. All right. And then he basically has this. So I don't know. I figured kind of building it up a little bit would be it would be a little helpful. Um, so this is like the logging services. Some of this, oh, this is the config file stuff. We can kind of ignore that for now. So the config file, that had to do with pulling in like the settings. Um, so if you look at James's implementation, he's basically taken, I think, is this essentials? Yeah, that's essentials. All right. Um, this is, I'm, I'm learning too. I just pulled his thing down. So <laughs> that's funny. Is that actually- The util is an extra class, I think, that he added. Mr. Is Ryan it? Davis in the house. What's oh, it is. Look at that. All right. Let's see. All right. I'm not going to pull that in because I'm not going to really be using that. So um, I don't know. That's not, I don't think that, this is, so this is the idea of pulling in that setting file you could use to sort of configure different aspects of your program. Um, so if you'll kind of see from his blog here, he's... Um, what else is he configuring? Oh, hello. So this is his example here is pulling in like a configuration element, uh, this hello message, which he then uses later in a, in a, in a configuration block here. See, so here now in configure services, he's grabbing that configuration. So this would be a way that you could say pull in. Um, so yeah, so let's, let's grab our configure services here. So configure services is typically where you're setting up. It's funny being on the forum scene so long. So now I just by default delete private when I see it. <laughs> it's just like, it's yeah, I don't even really have a strong opinion, but it's just what happens in life. <laughs> um, so anybody who's not, I don't know how familiar people are with stuff, but in, um, so I service collection in the, in this sort of world is your, is your registration container. So uh, it's basically just a list of service descriptors. Uh, it's itself doesn't have really any sort of behavior. Um, and then all of the behavior there is sort of implemented. Uh, the extending behavior from here is now implemented just through extensions. So you can this is where you sort of start setting up your um, your DI stuff, for example. Uh, or if you didn't really care about doing um, you know, interfaces to things. You can just register. Is that not what the type is called? Uh, what's it called? Items view model. All right. Oh, it items view model. All right. Yeah. So that's basically just registering your types. Um, there's some of the stuff here with registration we're curious about as well. Um, you know, like, could we make this less verbose, like less having to specify these? Is there some stuff through code generation we could do? 
um, so that users don't have to sort of uh, specify every single type on here. You know, is there is there something we could do with that? I don't know. Those will be some of the stuff that we'll answer once we start looking more into. Um, Cause so we're going to look at some of the code generation and things for the registrar to switch that stuff out. So I thought there might be something we can do with this as well. So you don't have to do all of this, but at the point you're starting to use um, dependency injection and things like that, you're fairly familiar with uh, this type of syntax. <laughs> so, cause you, you have to do that for little, for most, most all of the, the platforms. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is kind of our basic setup at this point. Um, so this is just kind of using that default hosting model. Uh, and then here we can add our, let's add our our actual app. So this is this is making it so, did you have a question at all? Yeah, I, I so something I found curious, uh, and I don't, I assume there's, this has to be somewhere. Uh, putting the service provider reference on the app as a static uh, field, I guess. Um, is that just, like, is there another way to do that? Is that the preferred way to do that? Like, All right, yeah, so that's a good point. So that that's actually, that's something we need to look into as well. Cause so this is, this here is super not recommended. <laughs> okay, that's- Especially- that's it makes my yeah, it, makes, yeah, yeah. it makes me a little awkward, and so that yeah. usually is a All sign right. that somebody once upon a time chastised me for doing something like that. All right, let's get rid of that and see what we where we can go. So that's definitely I remember there's something you can do. Yeah, like even in the even in the web, I think there's a way you can do. Um, I think sometimes people will say you should do it through like a. Um, uh, Forget. There's like some interface you can also you can register inside your services, um, but like your iService provider is all injectable. Um, so I don't know. This is where you start getting into the the conversation of like, should you even know what an iService provider is? And then a big flame war starts about um, <laughs> constructor injection versus. Um, Proper. Oh, I'm forgetting the name of the. No, Proper. the other one. The, um, What's it called? Where you actually just use the container to get the type instead of construction injection. Oh, resolution. No, someone in the stream is going to correct going to correct me on the term. Um, service locator. There it service is. Service locator. There, yeah, that's good. I got it. The service locator pattern. So you'll see a bunch of that stuff. So, um, Anna Betts actually did a really cool uh, Stack Overflow post about service locator patterns in mobile. Um, so, cause like things like splat and stuff like that are all service locator based, which is a little, which I mean, this is definitely case by case, but in a mobile world, you know, you're not dealing with as massive surface areas. I think it's like a web and things like that. And, and a lot of stuff is about performance. So like a lot of people on the mobile side will opt for service locator because one, um, it's fast. It can be faster Two, you can make it lazy uh and things like that so i don't know i don't want to start a big play more about that stuff but let's 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 keep it non-private and see what happens in our life um because it should just inject i i'm not sure if it i think it'll inject it i can't remember if you have to register like a factory type on it uh like you might have to register a type to contain the i service provider i don't remember but uh whatever so this was kind of one thing that I was playing with as well. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. There's kind of interesting scenarios you could do here. So like, let's say, uh, how does this work? I don't even remember how this works. App shell. Okay, cool. So like app shell here. So like, let's say we create, let's say we create kind of an interface here called like, um, I don't know. I feel like I might be getting too deep into like <laughs> dependency <laughs> injection. Yeah, just make <laughs> yeah, this work, I, man. Just make this work. <laughs> we have. Well, I, I get itchy when you don't run the, the simulator emulator for very long, you know. <laughs> yeah, but there's kind of neat things you could do here. So this is just kind of one sample. You could create an interface called like startup page, for example, and this could even just be something we have inside forms. You know, you could then you annotate that. You add transient here, like this. You call this. Uh, I forget the order. Let's just see if it's right. It's I startup page first. app shell. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it. Cool. Yeah. So you could do something like that. And then here now in our app, what we could do. Oh, I hit F11. Why did I hit F11? All right. Oh. Then we can go into our app here. 
go into our app here. Why does it not go? Is there? Oh, it's yeah, because of the generated stuff. Then here on our app, we could add a constructor parameter, startup page, startup page like that. Ooh, isn't that fun? And then here we could, which people might get mad about as well, because I'm going to cast it. <laughs> if I was better, I would do something like this in here and say page or something, and then you could grab it. Um, but yeah, so, you know. I don't know, just kind of a neat way things could go. So like if our if the app is always created through the service provider, so like a lot of this code could even move eternally here, you know? Like this is stuff that would just maybe be inside of Maui, you know? And we might have certain interfaces that you could add to stuff uh, that would just know, you know? Like you could annotate something with a startup page uh, or something like that. Uh, none of this stuff is things where, just so everyone knows, this isn't stuff that we've decided on. This is sort of just uh, just showing kind of things that you can enable here. So um, I don't know, hopefully this runs. If I have to spend the next like 15 minutes debugging a dependency injection, I'm gonna be super sad. <laughs> uh, oh, I don't think I actually call the init. No, I didn't call the init. Yeah, so say. yeah, so we're gonna, we have to call the init to load the application, uh, which I kind of forgot about <laughs> here. And then, um, oh yeah, this was kind of another interesting example here that uh, that James showed. So another thing you can do, this is, so this is kind of the way you could register sort of your uh, other interfaces. So this configure, this configure service function um, is now gonna be called uh, by your init, you know? So now this will let you configure uh, platform uh, specifics if you want. So yeah, what is um, the uh, <clears throat> what is the native navigation services doing? Anything? Yeah, this one here. Yeah. So that's what the that's what the this this action is here, this configure services. So this is just a function that's passed into startup init uh, that gets called by uh, that gets called by configure services. So like for example in his demo, he basically uh, you know, he registers an interface here, um, yeah, for for like a platform implementation of something. Uh, yeah, I'm, I maybe said configure services. I was referring to the native navigation call. Like what? What here? Yeah, like what is that? It doesn't. Oh, does, that's just it? calling the action that's passed in. Oh, okay. Yeah, I it's just called the native. Then, I guess I don't like the name. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what's uh I don't know what it should be, but how we configure services, I don't know. Uh -huh. Um yeah, so that's uh yeah, so I don't know. Let's see if this actually wires up. Um I haven't built his sample from the beginning like there is here, so I hope there's not some configuration element that I forgot. Um I don't think so. Clicking, I'm not clicking through anything right now. I'm just thinking while I look off to the right <laughs> to see. All right, cool. Yeah. All right. So let's just see if that sort of wires up. Um, build little demo build. Uh, yeah. All right. No, huh? James, your sample works. I I used it last week. It works. James is saying in the chat, "Don't trust his sample." <laughs> no, it's good. All right, so here's configure services. All right, so nothing's crashed yet. Um, it's called in. Here's the startup page. Here's the app shell, um, and there's the shell. Cool. Look what? at that. Yeah. So Man. see, it's kind. Of I don't know. It's just kind of this neat way to sort of tie everything together. And so this is where everyone who starts out with dependency constructor injection, when they first start, there's always a cool realization of just how magical some stuff becomes. Um, so it's cool because the, oh, okay. So yeah, this is where we start to kind of enable some of the, the shell stuff. So this is the stuff I was playing with yesterday. All right. So let's, um, so like what we want to do here with shell, um, that's not shell. Where's shell? Here's shell. All right. So what we want to do with shell now is let's say we want. Okay. Our so we're we're leaving behind we're leaving behind the serve the extensions, right? And now we're transitioning to shell. Is that what's happening? 
Yeah, so now we're sort of tying it in. So now what I'm doing is I'm tying, so now that we've enabled the application, now that we've enabled the application so that it can, it has service location, it has um, DIIOC features, like what can we do with that? You know, now what can we do with um, for, what can we do with Maui to make it a cool experience, you know? So that's that's what this next part is about. So the part this is now where um, so like wouldn't it be cool if our items page here um, always that always messes me up. I hit F twelve and it goes to like a string type. Mm. <laughs> like, like I wanted to go to items page. Um, wouldn't that be fancy? Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. So like what we want items page, but here we want items page to uh, you know we want I think items if page. I think if you installed right? mFractor, I think that would work. I think that you could actually do that. And they have a Windows yeah. version now, so. I don't have to try that out. Did I met, did I register my items view model? I don't remember if I did. Um, yes, I did. Cool. So, like, what if we want this? What if we want this items view model injected? And then, what if we want just a few extra things injected? So. Um, so this is where you where some of the, the benefit of um, let me close some of my things I'm all tabbing between. Uh, try, I don't remember the names of everything. So like the logger, for example, or mm -hmm. so like Jane, this, these are the things that James, for example, injected in here. So like what if these are some of the things you want on your um, you know that you want to use in your view model? So this is all stuff now that's coming that's that's just for free. Uh, because we're using, oh, this has to add a reference, doesn't it? All right, we'll ignore that. We'll just use the logger for now. And then we grab the logger. Uh, I think that'll work. Cool. So what we do is we want this items page to be created. So um, this is something that we could probably bake into forms, into Maui more. But like, let's say we made it so all the temp, so let's create kind of our own sort of data template here, um, shell content data template and then let's wire up let's create a data template that's wired up to um that's wired up through service location right so let's create a markup extension here uh like that and then uh let's see public stream type name so this is the type that gets passed in uh contents property um type name here. Cool. All right. So now this is this is now where we can sort of tie something into the service provider. All right. So this might be a case where I'm not too sure how we would do this without statics. So this might be a place here where we need to kind of provide a better experience to inject something in. Um, because like this data, if, if that makes sense, because see this data template here uh, isn't create, it's created through the XAML. Okay. So this is a place where I kind of cheated and grabbed like the service locator, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So this is kind of one of those places where it, uh, where we would kind of need to, uh, needed to sort of wire in. So this is, but this is, this is a place where it would sort of just start working. So um, yeah, cause see, we are already passing in an iService service provider. So we could hook this up to the normal service provider, you know, um, and pull that in. I'm not sure what the service provider, does this is just a dependency service? Cause we could still maybe, mm -hmm. um, is that what that is? Is that just the, uh, uh, we've got some ASP.NET Core developers in the uh, chat here, so they might be able to tell you. Oh, well, this is from Forms. So I think this, let's see oh, if we can. That iService let's see if we can not. Yeah, I think it's dependency service. But let's sort of continue this idea here. So now if we take the shell, this is, so this is a markup extension. Markup extensions are fun. Um, this should resolve to the type. Cool. Yes? No? Maybe? Uh, local one. It created a new namespace. Oh, did do that. Oh, did I already? Oh, because local's already taken. All right, all right, all right. I see. We'll just say local one. All right. So this is just a markup extension. Um, so this is the markup extensions are fun because you can just kind of define your own things here. Um, 
This code here, a lot of the template, I just kind of stole from our data template uh, code. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think you might need extension on the end of this uh, for, I don't remember if you actually need that, but I think this is going to inject in the dependency service. Um, and if we start running a little long at this, I can switch to some more completed things, but I don't know. I think it's sometimes easier to follow as you build things up. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> this is great. So well, I'm learning, doesn't that? But the, I'm not the audience. So if anybody. Yeah, wants I wanted to, to see. All right. So XAML service provider. All right. So that's a cost. So this is a place where we might hook into something <clears throat> that's a little more um, where we sort of tie a lot of this stuff together. So like the XAML service provider should probably be something that ties into the other, the iService provider that we create from like the .NET stuff. If that makes sense. Um, so let's see, is there a way? I'm trying to think if there's a way to do this without. I think the way they recommend doing this with um, with .NET is to still is to never it's not set the service provider that you still inject it in. Um, I don't know if there's a way to do this currently with form stuff. So we we might have to fall back on using a static for now. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just kind of thinking. Yeah, nothing's coming to me as far as where we could sort of hook in. Um, I just wanted to see, does this get injected in? I think this gets injected in. Let's see. I don't have... Where's my Twitch stream? I'm not following the Twitch stream, so hopefully... <laughs> Twitch room's fine. Why? What? Oh, I'm not seeing any questions. Oh, okay. Anything, so. Yeah, the, uh, the last couple of comments were from uh, some folks who have some experience with these patterns. Brave Cobra 2 says he's creeping out. Please don't do that. Stop. Oh, no. Do what? I don't know. Whatever you're doing. Brave Cobra, tell us, show us the way. How should we do this? <laughs> yeah. All right. So yeah, the service provider does get injected in. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I know normally the way you could do it is, is you know, not grab the service provider. Because I think even in um, other stuff, you know, they usually say re register some sort of your own type that you can inject the service provider in. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I think we'll still, I don't think there's a way to tie it into the data, the markup extensions, unfortunately. So these are the areas where, um, yeah, these are the areas where it, it'll it'll help to kind of pull this stuff through. Because um, ideally, you know, this service provider would be the uh, .NET one. Um, but yeah, oh, why did that crash? So the recommendations wanted... coming through the chat here. Um you probably want a private read-only I service provider above the constructor. Don't inject the service provider everywhere. Yeah, not injecting it. I, well, I think this is where some of the language may be getting a little confused. So like this I service provider isn't associated with the I service provider that's part of .NET, that's part of the .NET core. This, mm -hmm. is, a, this is a XAML service provider. Um, so this is an internal forms thing, uh, that's pulled into the method. Um, yeah, so, but I don't think there's a way we can access it. We can do what I want to do here because this is creating from, cause this is just the XAML service loading from XAML. Um, so yeah, this is where we're talking about some of those things. Um, this is where we're sort of talking about those things where it'd be nice to pull this in. Because ideally, the service provider would be, uh, so ideally, what we would do is something like this, as you could say, you know, service provider dot get service. Um, uh, what's the syntax on that? Hold on, let me grab the type. Um, it's, uh, t -t 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 -t. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So let me just pull this stuff because there, there's a whole resolver part of this as well. So, all right. So this is our data template extension. Um, I'm just kind of copying this from uh, our implementation of data template. So it's nothing that crazy. Basically, it's just text checking the string name um, to see if it's null or empty. Uh, and then it's here's a type resolver that we have implemented uh, on forms. So I don't know. This might be getting a little too nuanced here and falling out of the category of useful. But um, yeah. So there's not a great way. Yeah, I don't know. We might, we'll probably just make it static for now just to sort of move the demo along. But um, yeah, so these are the things that we, we want to sort of enable on the Maui side better. Um, I don't think enough stuff gets registered on the XAML one. So, all right, well, let's just grab it. Let's just grab it for now. Um, all right, let's just grab it for now, just so we, it's not the best way to do it. But I'm not sure if there's a different way we can inject the, um, the service provider. Uh, I'm not sure if there's another way we can sort of inject it just because of the limitations on forms, you know? So this is one of those cases where I was sort of saying, once we kind of pull this stuff through forms, then we don't have, through Maui, then we don't have to sort of hack this stupid code in, this, you know, not great code. Because um, the debate on service locator, fine, but a static provider kind of like this, I don't know. That's probably not going to be great. But the main idea here is that we've tied in our shell data template to using the service provider. So then now with that, the cool thing about that is now when our items page here is newed up, and then let's um, let's register the about page as well, just so that's being set. Oh, where was the app? Oh, wait, no, we did it in the startup, I remember. Here we go. Items page, let's add our about page. Yeah, so I don't know. All I know is however we implement this, it's going to be wrong. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's why we include and we do this in the open and we get feedback. And that's why there's going to be a spec yeah. out there for a while. So today it will be wrong. In the future, we'll yeah. make, it, make it super wrong. Yeah, well, even in the future, whenever it comes to dependency injection patterns in IOC, you're, you're always wrong to about 30% of the people. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just the way it works. But yeah, so here you can see now our items page is being created from the um, the definitely not great pattern, but it's being created from the data template. So ideally, all of the data templates code internally uh, would, would operate through the service provider. They would just sort of get injected into forms. And then at that point, see, now we have our logger injected and we have our items view model injected. So this kind of lets has some neat scenarios with the shell stuff, um, kind of just being able to pull these things in. Um, and then, so where we could sort of even extend this more is, I forget, does this have, do they, there's a push on here, isn't there? Yeah, push modal. So another area we can do this. So this was where I pulled in, um, let's see, let me pull in my class here. Uh, yeah. So the other kind of neat thing we could do with pulling this into shell is we could create, I created this nice little class here. So one thing you can do with shell when you're, when you're setting it up, um, is it has this routing thing, right? So routing dot register route, uh, the name, and then you can, you can input a route factory. So this lets you sort of modify how uh, the types are created. So what I did there was I created a route factory here. Dun, da, da. Route factory, which basically lets you, um, which, <clears throat> which lets you register routes and then it uses the service provider to create those. So it's it's a, it's a, you know this is another way to sort of tie stuff into shell. So you could do you know register, um, you would do you know 
you could just say service provider factory register route uh, type of about page or something like that, you know? And then that's going to now just register that within the... Um, now that's going to create, make the route so it just uh, gets registered one with shell. And then when it's actually created, um, this was a syntax there when I was messing with it yesterday. And then when shell creates it, see, it just gets the service, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So now when you're routing stuff with shell, uh, when you do like the go to async, it'll just create this about page through, um, it'll just create this about page through the service provider, you know? So now we can go back, we can go to our about page and um, it's going to give me both of them, isn't it? Yeah, and then on our about page, we could add whatever interfaces we want. About page doesn't have a view model, so it's not that interesting. Um, but yeah, so it, it, it's kind of this neat way to sort of hook things together. Um, and then another extension, of this, which would be neat, which I kind of want to do with shell is make it so you don't even have to specify content templates. So for example, what you could do is do something like route um, items page. This isn't going to work because we'd have to wire up some stuff with shell. Uh, but then these routes here would also just check these here, you know? So if I have a, a route registered like this items page, like that, then it, it can just, um, it'll just automatically create this. You know, you don't even have to specify the template on here. It's mm -hmm. just it's just matching the route to something. Mm -hmm. um, so this more correctly should be also passing in service collection, but you know, yeah. So that's kind of, that's some of the shell stuff I was talking about while I was showing. That's one of the nice things about shell over, uh, over non-shell apps is that non-shell apps are all um, type create all uh, concrete types. You know, you create the type and then you push it. Whereas shell is all type based. It's all um, it's all data template based for creating the pages. So that's what kind of allows you to sort of wire this in really easily. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So that's kind of most of the stuff with the the, the injection. Uh, so a lot of these are things that we wonder if we could clean up um, to make it a little less um, verbose for people. Most new developers probably wouldn't really care about much of this stuff. Um, but then once they, they start to, you know, play with some of the the more involved, once, once you sort of get along in your path, it'll be nice to sort of have this stuff set up. Um, and then it also has a lot of nice tie-in with sort of like HTTP contact stuff, um, a lot of the logging features. Uh, and, and then at some point, we could even sort of configure services. Like right now, if you add like an identity server or something to .NET, you can set up, you know, whatever it is, like, I don't know, use identity. I, for, I forget exactly where you specify it. But um, we could do something similar with, you know, Google Maps uh, and, and, and anything like that to configure sort of these common setups here. So yeah, this is this is just kind of the stuff that that it gets enabled. So these are a lot of the things that MVVM frameworks already do. You know, like they a lot of them already have this type of registration. And then you go from there. You know, you reg you register and then you use whatever their navigation system is. So most MVVM frameworks usually have an abstraction layer on top of the forms navigation to enable these types of features. You know, like uh, they'll have some sort of I navigation service that they create that you pass a type into that then goes through whatever um, service, whatever service location you've set up, whatever. Um, IOC container you've set up. And uh, this also then enables really simple plugging into other features. So for example, you can just, uh, so uh, I thought it was, is that not it? What was the, I thought there was a, I don't know what the name was. There's a way to create a generic one, but I forgot the name. So like with Autofac, all you have to do with Autofac, I think it's on the service collection, is you pull it in and you just say, you know, use, auto fact service provider 
factory, mm -hmm. you know? And then at this point now, Autofac is what's is going to give a customized service provider that handles everything. Yeah. When I used, uh, when I was playing around with this, I ended up uh, plugging in dry IOC um, and yeah. they provide a separate package that's an adapter. So it has a method on the host builder where you, you tie that in um, and then you can build up that container. And uh, yeah, so I thought, it was, I thought it was pretty cool that you could pretty easily swap things out. Um, I think, yeah, you know, for, for me, I think this is, because obviously this can get pretty complicated. Um, and even as your, your example here shows, it's very powerful. But to, as you mentioned, to a new developer, new to, new to mobile, new to building apps with .NET MAUI, um, this would be a lot to consume. But in its basic form, I like it because it really gives you a clear indication of what to put where, which yeah. is, is helpful, right? Especially when, and if putting what where follows an existing pattern already established in .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, those ecosystems, those workloads, um, I can, I can, those are all pluses in my pros column for this kind of a thing. Yeah, and then some of this stuff we could, uh, uh, there might be places to sort of, uh, this was this was a point that uh, I think Daniel was making, uh, instead of having to sort of hook all into the provider, are there other ways that we could enable uh, this behavior without being so um, intense, you know? So for example, right now, like I was saying with Shell, with Shell, you do this routing thing, right? Register route. So like, what if what if our shell registration all just uses this service provider route factory here, you know? And then users who are registering with shell never actually even see any of this. It's just part of your uh, initialization uh, routine. So like the initialization routine would maybe be something like, you know, forms.init, and then you could do like, from there you could do like, uh, you know, I don't know, shell routes, here and then uh, here you, you would get some sort of routing context. I don't know what it would be called. And then you could do something like, uh, you know, register, like add, uh, add view, which could be, um, you know, like view model comma view or something like that. You know, like what if there was some, just something like, like this mm -hmm. uh, where you didn't, you didn't, you didn't really have to worry about all of this stuff here. So this is and our fluent the, initializer, kind of like what Constantine was proposing. Right. You could do something like this. And then uh, and then we wouldn't even have to specify. You could specify a route name, but the default for it could just be the type. You know what I mean? Like it could just grab whatever the type is on here. And then at this point, you only you don't even have to construct or inject the view model. Like once we instantiate the view, we could then just pull the view model and set it as the binding context on the view, you know? Because mm -hmm. um, that's like how a lot of the frameworks work or that's how they do with like view model navigation. Um, and then this, you could even, we could even make this twofold so that if the user routes with a string, we could look for, you know, a view model with that name or a view with that name to then give people like view model navigation and stuff like that. Um, and then at that point, what we've done is we've wired in there. So even if they're using bad, not the best sort of maybe principles, they've at least now adapted how they're, our, we've adapted our registration methods to use the service stuff. Mm -hmm. And then once they start to get more involved with it, they would be like, oh, okay, cool. So I've seen this stuff about an IHTTP context factory. That's cool. I want to call that from my view model. And then at that point, they just go to their view model, you know, they add it to, uh, you know, they just go to their items view model, they add it to the items view model up here, and they have it. Mm -hmm. um, if they want to add some logging, they can just go to any of their pages and do logging um, or, or anything of that nature. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is, we, uh, this has definitely not been developed super far, but um, yeah, it's just there's... I, there's a lot of different ways we could kind of hook hook this up to um, enable kind of some nice scenarios. So, 
Yeah, I yeah. think there's a, a lot to uh, to do there. I'm going to post a link to the to that spec for those who want to go uh, read up more on this and engage in that conversation. Do you have the app bar or the tabs that we could look at for a little bit? Yeah, that one we could probably just start from the app, I guess. Okay. Let uh, let's see, because we have about 30 minutes. Yeah, we've got 30 minutes, so maybe we'll just... I'll, I'll walk through what I did, um, and then we can start just styling it, okay. uh, kind of based on some of those designs you had. Um, but just to sort of reiterate, just to sort of um, bring this around again. All right, never know which browser to click on. Uh, here's the link. I can't post links because I don't think I have a sword anymore. Oh, there we go. Cool. So here's the spec. Uh, all your comments and stuff just post into here. Um, so that, and then we can have kind of a conversation on it. Um, like, uh, Richie here was talking about, he's, he does, a, he's done a bunch of stuff with, uh, shiny with these. So I'll kind of talk to him. So yeah, a lot of it is that I'm just kind of curious what people are using, um, and where, where a lot of this would be super helpful. So, uh, yeah. So like, he's sort of talking about the route extension, like I was saying here is using it off of the, off of the services. So. Uh, yeah. So what are the ways? Does this make it too complicated? Is this actually useful? Like if people are going to use a DI container with forms, they're just going to use a DI container with forms. You know what I mean? So <laughs> like, is, is there ways we can we can um, leverage that as a first class citizen? So yeah, have your conversations on here. I'll respond to anything and we can sort of chat it out. Cool. Um, quick question that I see in the chat that I wanted to address because I think it's come up a few times. Uh, Brave Cobra is asking, would love to see GDK running. We don't have any GDK to show you today. Um, but uh, so what is the kind of the future of Linux with .NET MAUI? And so uh, we have the GDK Sharp backend for Xamarin Forms today. Um, I, I have a sense that a few customers are using it, but it's not widely used. If you are using it, I would love to know what you're doing with it. Um, the, uh, it's on GDK Sharp 2 or GDK 2. Um, there's a potential to move it to GDK 3. It was discussed a while back. Didn't happen uh, for reasons that I don't even remember. Um, but uh, in .NET MAUI, our initial focus is going to be on Windows and Mac OS. Um, there is certainly the potential and the interest I'm, I'm hearing plenty of, and we have been hearing .NET Conf, we heard it. Um, we heard it at Ignite last year. So uh, of, of extending that also to support Linux and, and GDK Sharp. So uh, we very well may do that. Um, would love to continue to hear feedback from you on how, how you'd like to see that happen, what your scenarios are, what your demand is for it. Um, so that we can it help us to prioritize that work and set clear expectations. But um, long story short, right now, it's not part of the roadmap and the plans. Um, the community certainly is welcome to um, contribute and we'll facilitate that as we did with WPF and GDK Sharp, et cetera. But um, right now, we're not committing to uh, putting that on the roadmap just yet. I know you don't like the name. I know. It'll be okay. All right. What are we doing? Are we doing tabs? Are we doing app bar? Yeah, I was just getting some stuff uh, running up and running here. Uh, so this is a lot of the stuff Javier worked on. Um, he base he's the cool thing is is that it's all just cross platform implemented app bar. So if you look. This is the entire app bar that Javier built. It's all just a net standard project built using Xamarin Forms components. So this is all just, it's a content view, and then it's a bunch of grids and stuff moved around. <laughs> um, so I keep having different apps here. Yeah, so it's he has kind of all these neat little features. See, here you can add these like little toolbar items. Uh, you can easily change the height. Um, add kind of a title view, do kind of these cool formats on it. So th there's also two specs for this stuff here. Does he have the scroll stuff working? I'm not sure. Yeah, there you go. So he has some scroll stuff here working uh, with animations. That's awesome. 
Yeah, and this is all cross-platform. So, you know, that's all, um, I mean, let's even look at his sample here real quick, out of curiosity. Expand for me. Um, like, what does he have here? I was just going to kind of see. I haven't, let's see, where's the, where's the app bar? I think it's at the bottom of the uh, grid. It's at the bottom of the grid. Oh yeah, there's the app bar. Scroll behind. Auto hide. Auto hide. That's too hard. I can't that. type. I can't type all that. <laughs> That's too hard. That's fantastic. So, yeah. so easy. Yeah, it is cool. So like he just, I don't even know how he's doing. I mean, it's, it's just a forms thing. So I mean, does he do animate? Yeah. See, he just uses these animations. Uh, so I'm guessing he's just using the animation libraries. Maybe I'm not really sure. I just hit the dependencies. It's I know he has some of his own animation stuff. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's basically just, um, there it is, translate. So yeah, I see here, he's just translating the app bar as the child is scrolling here. So um, yeah, and that's basically it. So the whole app bar is just, you know, about 800 lines of forms code. Uh, which which enables just a lot of really cool scenarios. So and he has this working. I think uh, I think it, I mean it's just forms. It's straight up forms. So it works. It should work on every platform. Um, his sample repository I think has it against UWP, Android, and iOS right now. So yeah, it's basically kind of like a coordinator layout thing. Yeah, you can use it for you can use it for anything. So. Um, yeah, let's see. I think I have it on here. Yeah, so here's his tab view gallery, which is the same stuff. So it has a bunch of neat custom tab. Yeah, and he did show me one where he put the app bar at the bottom. So it's like the hamburger was at the bottom and everything. Oh, yeah? All right. I don't know. Is that one of the... Let's see. Is there a, is there a uh, positioning? Let's see. Yeah, I think there is. Oh, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, sorry, I'm being silly. So, I mean, the app bar is basically just... You put it wherever. Yeah, you put it wherever. So, it's just a control. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, it's basically just a control that he had, that he's defined in the content. So, where this starts to come into place is um, stuff like, you know, if you had this app bar and you just dropped it into our title view, uh, you could use that to replace like the entire app bar um, or, you know, being able to add more customization. So, for example, on Shell, you could just we could set up a content template for your bar that then just uses this app bar and lets you customize everything, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just it's it, it allows instead of having to figure out how to do all this stuff on every platform, you know, we might as well use the cross platform aspects. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, which is cool about the tab stuff. Cause like customizing the views on a UI tab bar is not fun. Uh, super weird. I've been known yeah, to you just... say that once or twice. <laughs> yeah. So it, it kind of enables these really neat scenarios. Um, so I can kind of build, I can demonstrate some of this, a bit so i wired up so what i'm curious what one thing i'm curious about is where we can start pulling this stuff into shell more so um one of the things that we're talking about with with shell is man why do i keep opening this <laughs> i need to remember it's in my private tab all right one of the things that we're talking about with shell is is, is allowing things that have like deeper nesting so there's probably a lot of ways. Oh, wait, actually, that was part of the Xamarin. Uh, so this is all stuff even, I don't know, when, what what are we thinking for the tab view stuff? We're going to try to land, are we landing just that stuff in Maui or are we going to? No, no, that's, uh, we, we have, so the reason that Shane's asking is because with all the uh, shifting of schedules and things related to .NET 5, .NET 6, and Xamarin, uh, we, we originally planned it for Xamarin Forms. And then we were like, hey, you know what? Maui's coming up really fast, so let's put it into .NET Maui. And then we're like, oh, now we're not going to ship .NET Maui until 2021 
fall. So it's like, well, we're not going to wait to ship this because it's valuable. We know developers and customers need it and want it today. It's ranked super high on all of our, uh, all the data that we measure. So let's, let's put it back in Xamarin forms and let's ship it. So it's, it's so close, as you can see, it's, <clears throat> it's looking really good. So yeah, Xamarin forms 4.8, I think we want to start previewing it. We'll see if that uh, manifests. Um, I think that's my, maybe what I put into the roadmap. Um, and then call it stable by five is the, is the plan. Cool. Yeah, so that's definitely, so like for example, with Shell, um, we'd like to enable it so you could maybe nest things. So for example, this would be, you could specify like a t the tab bar from your bottom, the tab bar from your top, and then like another top one. So I know you're looking at this and you're thinking, that's crazy, who would do that? I mean, this is this is the Spotify app. This is me basically just copying the exact Spotify app and <laughs> putting it into Shell. Like that's what this is. And, um, and like I did actually yeah. call him crazy when he actually explained this to me. I'm like, <laughs> no, nobody does that. Oh no, it's the Spotify app. No, it's not. Yeah, little, it's, little it's did really, I know. Little did I. Yeah, know. I mean, then, but the way they do it, it makes it. I think because I think some of the confusion was even with um, some of the like some of the stuff. The way they do it, you might not think of it as tabs because it's more. It's not like hard tab bar at the bottom. You know, it's just sort of like a navigation concept. So, um, but yeah, I mean, this is basically if you go to the library tab on your on Spotify. It has three layers of tabs. So Spotify has uh, the its main tabs is just like your home search and um, this should have a title on it library. And then um, from there, there's another tab bar that's defined as your you know your music and your podcast. And then within that, there's another sets of tabs. So this is one of the things that we're looking at um, is is being able to sort of deeply nest the shell stuff, but uh, I my thinking for this is that we want to do this with Javier's tab view things instead of uh, making it all just native, you know, tab views on tab. Because once you start nesting native, it gets a little bit crazy, uh, especially on iOS. Some of the material iOS stuff enables some better nesting because mater the material it's cool in material iOS. The UI, the tab bar controller that's part of Material is just the tab bar. Like it's just a UI view that you can use anywhere. Uh, whereas on iOS, uh, the UI tab bar normally comes from a tab controller. So you kind of have this weird sort of behavior. So our tab badges for shell on the radar. So this is, a, so that, okay. So that then tie, ties even more into this stuff here because if we look at Javier's stuff, um, so this is why, I don't know, I need to just comment on that issue. I feel really bad, but I know there's an issue out there with badges, but one of the things that we're looking at is, is like, should we just use, you know, the tab view stuff for the badges? Cause look, this, it just has the badges on here. And like, if you look at the badge implementation that's currently on forms, um, a lot of that implementation is even just doing stuff like this. It's basically at, it's basically taking the layout of the elements and positioning a badge onto a certain location. Uh, so yeah, a lot of like this badge stuff would be really cool. The badge stuff I think would be cool to pull out and and make it as like a attached property or something that we could put on any view. So not even just on the tabs. Like I'm curious if we could make the badge implementation here more generic. But yeah, I mean, look at that tab, the the badge stuff. Ooh. How long do you think people would be entertained by this? All right, so <laughs> I'm that that uh, layout just it's the first time I saw it. I'm like, what is this? What is happening? Why did he put the buttons below the tabs? Just because he could, because the tabs can so, go yeah. anywhere. Yeah, because you can do it. Oh, look what he! Oh, he even does this here. Look, it switches out the tab icons as you scroll. So, and this is yeah, it's cool stuff. So, it is. Yeah, it's really cool. So I just, I, it's, we need to just make it all just work on this stuff. So this is definitely like with these nested tabs. Like I, I'm all in with just doing that. Um, just using the tab view. You know, just once you get even the, uh, we might even just do it at the highest level because like the tabs right now, I don't feel like they really give you that much um, natively, you know, 
It's just it's just a bar with two little buttons. So like So why is it so <laughs> hard, man? Why is it so hard? I don't ask iOS that, man, because to switch out those views on the tab control, it's gnarly. Um, I know, I've done but, it. But yeah, it's weird. You have to like register a custom view that it'll create, then you have to clear out their views and then add some. It's super weird. So just use just switch to Javier tabs. And this is where people are going, like with all the sharp NATO stuff and everything like that. It's just that's the direction. Um, yeah, people just want it's it's easier. Um this stuff is nice because it's all based against content views. So you could even put multiple tabs in a single page uh, and things like that. So one of the extensions I'm asking him for on the tabs is um, making it so it's not tied to content. So you could just do a tab view as just the tab view, uh, like an app bar, um, instead of, because right now the way the tabs work is that it forces content. Um, so I, it'd be nice if it worked maybe a little bit like the Android one, because Android's nice because you just have the tab layout and then you have like a view pager or something that you sort of tie together. So I was thinking it'd be cool to do something kind of like that. So instead of, uh, being able to sort of specify these tab view items as like almost how like the indicator view and the carousel views currently I was about work. to make that same analogy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So something like that would be cool. Um, so and this is where sort of some of the shell stuff would be neat because you could pop the tab view in <clears throat> as the cross-platform control, and then we could then control the native stuff still just from that cross-platform tab view if we wanted to. Um, but yeah, so uh, one of the things I did, let me drink some water real quick. Me too. <laughs> you got that big jug again. You know what's after us? Oh my gosh, you're going for it! Don't drown. Yeah, I haven't drank much today. <laughs> Sometimes after, you just start drinking water, and you're like, "Oh my god, it tastes so good." <laughs> after our session, uh, which we need to wrap up in five, ten, fifteen minutes, um, is uh, is the build happy hour, build social. So that'll be fun. I don't know what that means. Yeah. I don't know how that happens. I don't know what it means either. I know what I know what I'm doing. Do you know what you're doing? <laughs> I know what I'm doing. Yeah, probably similar. <laughs> I will probably yes. I will probably we gotta we gotta deliver yesterday. You got these canned Rieslings. Mm. I'll break up in a canned Riesling and wander around aimlessly in Hollow Knight trying to figure out where the heck I'm supposed to go. Um <laughs> I, I take it that's a game. Uh, that reference is yeah, lost. Completely lost on Metro V. It's a Metrovania style game that Easy turned me on to, I think, to drive me crazy. So I don't know. Maybe he's mad at me one day and he's like, play this game. And now I just sit on the couch screaming at the TV. I even threw the controller once. It's like being 10 again. Um, yeah. So <laughs> let's see. All right. So, yeah. So, one thing I did, let me, I think it should still be wired up. So, basically, what, what I did <clears throat> was I took Shell. Um, and this is, I really want to build this for shell, build like an X-plat shell uh, using this stuff. So it would basically just use all X-plat, all of our form stuff, uh, render shell using all of these things. And then at that point, you would have a shell that works on like Mac uh, and all those different places. So here we go. Oh, wait, I turned off the renders. All right. Well, this is probably a good example. So I don't have the app bar wired up yet with this example, but so this is a, a default shell implementation here. Um, so you see you here, you have your top tabs uh, and then here's your bottom tabs, right? All right, so that's default shell stuff. Let me activate the activate tab view. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that deserves a sound effect. I wish I had one for you. Did I delete it? No, I didn't delete it. Where is it? Here it is. All right. Um, so I know that these definitely need to be documented. Shell has really good extension points for all these things that only I know about. <laughs> so, but you can really, all I really did to swap, swap this out was I overrode the shell item renderer here, and then I replace it with this custom tab view shell renderer. Uh, which is just using Javier's tab stuff. So now if we go here, we can see, okay, cool. So now here's Javier's tabs. 
on that same design. So now what's neat is, all right, so what I've done too, was I've wired these up to um, custom forms types so we can kind of play around with it. Uh, yeah, so here the tab placement, if I just change this to top, I can change it to top. Ooh, look at that, the tabs move to the top. <laughs> yeah, and then you can just go to uh, the shell tab view here. You can just call this bottom like that. Now that places these on the bottom, see? So look at that. So now the tabs are the way, isn't that neat? That is bananas. Yeah, and the implementation for this was easy. Like if you go and look at my tab, my the renderer I wired up, um, all I'm doing to, to enable this is I implement the I shell item renderer. So that's what gets returned um, if you, when you implement the custom renderer on shell. And then all I'm really doing is when you change the shell item, I'm creating the views. So all this is doing is it's iterating over the shell item. So I iterate over shell items. If there's only a single item, it's not going to have two layers of tabs. So then I just I go down to the content. I create the content. I set that as the, the content on the tab view item. If there are more items, then I make each content uh, a new tab view here, like that. And then that and then that's what I set it to do, like the nested tabbing. So like that entire view that you saw there, it's only it's only 30 lines of code basically. To get, and then if you look at shell, so here's basically what I have rendering. You can see here's the tab, tab, and then here's this with like the nested tabs. Yeah. And so it, it was only 30 lines of code to basically just take um take that structure and make it uh, you know, make it just work with his tab view. And yeah. then at that point you get you get all the really cool behavior you do with his tab view stuff. So I mean this stuff here, I'm gonna check all this stuff in and and show it to Javier and work with him to just get get a version of Shell working on this stuff is I, I'd really like to get that going. So that, yeah, and then that this it's a, it's amazing. I mean I, I you gotta stop for a moment to fully appreciate just how difficult that would be without this. Right. And just how amazingly simple it was for you to do this. I'm almost getting a little weepy because uh, <laughs> it's it's this level of uh, of productivity that I'm really excited to deliver. This is this is why we do yeah, this. Yeah. Yeah, and then this is I mean I think this is just going to take it take over all I think I don't know. Like, we'll have to see performance and things like that, but I could see a future in like a year where we basically just delete all the shell renderers and it's just this, <laughs> you know, like maybe certain areas we can plug in for optimizations. But um, so like even one of the things you can see that he's done with the tab view stuff. So this was something I wanted to highlight. Um, so this is what we were talking about with the animations. If you go into his tab view, Let's see, is it part of the tab view source? Here it is, item transition. Yeah, so he's basically created this item transition interface here um, that where he's 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 transitioning the data. He's he's using uh, you know the translation X to indicate how it's gonna how it's gonna um, the views are gonna come in. So see here, he's just using uh, he's creating a new animation. He's adding it. He's committing it. So this is all just forms level animation right here, you know. Yeah. That's... So this is these are all animations that work on. Um, see, it's going into here. It's doing the selection changing, and then it's um, it's doing all the changes. So uh, and this is all through an interface here. So anybody could register. This is the default one that's just registered on the tab view. Um, oh, it's oh he did a carousel view example uh, using his tab view. Um, but yeah, the item transition is just registered as the default one. See on this tab transition property. So I could inst instantiate a custom tab transition here and just do whatever I wanted to do on it, which is yeah, it's nifty. So and then I haven't tied the two together quite yet. Nifty doesn't um, even begin but, to say what this is. 
<laughs> yeah, it's super cool. I was I was really excited how easy this was. So I, I really want excited for this to be a starting point. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be working with Javier a bunch on this because I really want to create a cross-platform shell renderer. Because <laughs> um, once we have the cross-platform shell renderer, then boom, right there. UWP, yeah. Mac, WPF, Tizen, exactly. your watch, everything. So here was an example. This is one thing that has that uh, Javier hasn't hooked up yet. So you'll see there's a back button. The back button is kind of just permanently on there. But what I did here was this is Javier's app bar as well. So all, I, all I'm doing here is I created this app toolbar tracker, which is instantiating his, uh, his app view control here this cross-platform control, and then I'm just wiring it into the shell stuff. So if, it, if you push a page, it, it does this here, and I'm just kind of wiring the buttons in and stuff. So it's, yeah, I don't know, it's neat stuff. But then, yeah, this is just now his custom app bar that we could, in theory, just do, uh, set up whatever we wanted to set up with the app bar. So, so yeah, so uh, some questions. People are definitely excited about this. I think I've conveyed how excited I am. Um, <laughs> where where will people be able to find this? You mentioned pushing it. Um, I'm not. Let me. I'll check with Javier where the best place to. He has. All right. So he has. Um, someone can post a link to his uh, repository. So right now these are these exist on his repository, uh, tab, app bar and tab view. Um, so what I'll probably do is I'll go into his samples um, that he's created here and I'll just create, I'll, I'll take what I've done here and add a shell sample to it. Um, and then him and I'll just kind of iterate on that uh, until we get a, a really cool version of shell just working on this. Okay. Um, so yeah, Thank that's, you. I don't, this is, this here is sort of, piecemeal together because this is running against source code and then this with his stuff i i added yeah i don't know this is kind of a weird cannibalized version that i could use during the stream so i need to kind of pull something together um but yeah i'm going to take all of this and push um pr over to javier's uh sample galleries and then in those sample galleries we'll start uh, kind of iterating on that more so i don't know if cool okay cool yeah so um uh so like posted that on uh the twitch view if you can see it there yep cool. so there's the tab view one there's also an app bar one sweepy if you want to post that one um it's just xamarinforms.bar i think uh yeah if you want to you want to post that one as well so cool well we are about out of time we have done it shane three hours Three hours. Does that feel I like three hours? <laughs> no, it doesn't. So that's how talks always are, though. It either feels way like, yeah, I don't know. I've done talks and it feels like I'm talking for like three hours and I look up and it's been like 20 minutes and you're like, oh my <laughs> God, I have nothing left to say. <laughs> it's so yeah. hard to always time these things. But no, that went, that went, that was really good. Yeah, no, this is great. If uh, anybody has like a final question, we do have like just a few minutes. Um, and then we need to uh, transition off, say sayonara. Uh, upcoming is the build uh, social, build happy hour, build social. I don't know what that means, but if you just stick around here, you'll find out. Um, okay, question from Dan. All the DI stuff we looked at will apply regardless of whether you want to build an app with MVVM or MVU architecture, correct? Yeah, so um, I'm going to say yes to that. At the moment, I know that we've had conversations about whether MVU should or should not even have uh, DI and, and inversion of control. Um, so really, the way I think about this is um, there are definitely some architectural differences between the two that make MVU work versus what makes MVVM work. Um, but as much as should be common and consistent between them should be common and consistent. Um, not so much so that you would be able to transition from one architecture to another architecture within the same code base, um, but so that your expectations are, if I have styles, I should be able to do the same styles, um, probably in the same way. So CSS, for example, or just the styles uh, API. Um, similarly, uh, you know, the end result. 
uh, should be a native application. I should be able to achieve the same level of uh, polish, performance, results, whether I've chosen to go the MVVM route, which you know we all know and love, uh, or the new hot MVU that everybody's super excited about. So um, I have a whole, I think, document on what those common things ought to be. And uh, yeah, other questions? We got two minutes. Shane, parting words. Well, thanks to everyone for watching and staying with us on these things. Uh, we're really excited about all the conversations. So yeah, I don't know. Just poke us on any of the issues, ping us on Twitter or whatever. Um, cool. Yeah. Thanks, John, for posting that in there. Uh, yeah. And thank you, John, for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, just ping us on Twitter, add an issue. Right now is the really exciting time to have all these conversations about the direction of these things. So uh, that's that's uh, we've been given kind of some extra time to make all this stuff super perfect. So, you know, we want to make the whole Maui experience as uh, dreamy as possible. So anything, anything that's ticking you off, create an issue in the Maui repo. Let's talk about it. Any of the things that are out there, um, this is this is a very pivotal time to really drive the direction of what this stuff's going to look like for the next five or 10 years. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is, this is the time for us to really, um, shine with a lot of this. So yeah, I don't know. Let's have those conversations. We awesome. want to hear from all of you. Great. I echo all those sentiments. It's been a great build so far. I think, uh, is there more stuff tomorrow or is this like we're nearing the end of this thing? I don't even know. I think this is it. I think, yeah, whenever the 48 hours is up, it's sometime in the next few Over, moments. Overnight. Um, yeah. All right. Cool, cool, cool. What's the thing going uh What's the big thing going on? Microsoft is doing X Windows now. Not entirely sure what you're, what you're asking. Oh, I think that was a comment on the name w, Windows 10X. No, I don't think there's any relation there. <laughs> gotcha. Between those two. Yeah, that is true, Clark, whether it, tomorrow is tomorrow. All right, everybody, uh, our time is up. So uh, it's time for us to say good night. Goodbye. We'll see you soon. What is the uh, what is the Lammy's name? Does it have a name? Oh, it doesn't have a name yet. I just got uh, it for my birthday. All right, we'll have to work on that. We'll, we'll talk about that. All right. Yeah. Uh, I am going to the start screen. Thanks, everybody. See ya.